Machnav is an Irish word encompassing reflection, contemplation, meditation, and thought. Machnav 100 is an invitation from the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, for us all to join him in reflecting on those seminal events of just 100 years ago on this island and further afield, their causes, their consequences, and the influence they may still have on the Ireland of today. As has already been reflected in this Machnav 100 series of seminars, history can be a contested and emotive subject. It is often viewed very differently depending on one's nationality, sense of identity, tradition, or background. History can be selectively recalled, forgotten, or ignored, and it has so often been used as a means of justifying contemporary action or inaction. A central motivation for President Higgins in bringing us this Machnav 100 series is to provide a space where, through a fuller or more inclusive understanding of our shared past, we might acknowledge its complexity and contradictions and perhaps free ourselves from its capacity to inhibit our consideration of options for a better shared future. Already in this Machnav series, we've considered the nature of commemoration itself, the nature of empire a century ago. The third Machnav seminar focused on issues of social class, land, and the role of women, and it was entitled Recovering Reimagined Futures. And I should mention that the proceedings of those first three Machnav 100 seminars have been published in book form. It's also an e-book and free of charge. It can be downloaded from the website president.ie. The second series of Machnav 100 seminars will focus on the civil war and the formation of two new administrations on the island which emerged after partition. And the first of those, this fourth Machnav, is entitled Settlements, Schisms and Civil Strife. It covers the events preci precipitated just a century ago by the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the schism it caused and the civil war it triggered. We're coming to you from Orison Uchtaron, the Hyde Room, uh, the home, of course, uh, Orison Uchtaron, the home of every Irish president since 1938. And the president will first welcome our audience to today's proceedings with a short introduction. I will then introduce Dermot Ferreter, our keynote speaker, and we'll then have four respondents to his paper, and then the president will follow with his own reflections on Professor Ferreter's paper. We will then conclude with the discussion with the panel and with our audience here in the Hyde Room. I now invite the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, to introduce today's series of reflections. All of the years covered by the decade of centenaries are significant in their own way. But 1921 is arguably the most critical of all. It was, after all, the year partition was formalised, the two jurisdictions on this island date from this year. They are a culmination of a set of events which can be traced back to the passage of the Home Rule Act in 1912 and the signing of the Ulster Covenant. 1921 saw the establishment on the 3rd of May of what was initially termed Southern Ireland, the 26 counties, and Northern Ireland, the six counties. The island partitioned as a result of the Government of Ireland Act 1920. The Northern Ireland Parliament had been set up in June 1921, but with Sinn Féin rejecting the Act, it was to be replaced in the South by the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921, which founded the Irish Free State as a self-governing dominion within the British Empire. The treaty provoked one of the most consequential debates on the shape of our country and would become a harbinger of civil war. 1921 also saw British forces and the IRA fight themselves to a standstill in the War of Independence, leading to a truce which allowed for negotiations. While those are some of the events that made the headlines from 1921, I do realize that on the ground, there is an important history that deserves far more prominence than it has received in both Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State. I refer to the efforts, for example, in the laborist tradition, as Henry Patterson puts it, a tradition that consistently sought to achieve advancement for workers, eliminate spurious divisions, and hold the tide against sectarianism. This is a topic which must be addressed in more detail in a future Machnav seminar. It is our intention in today's seminar to consider the view from below, the people's history of the time in question, which attempts to account for historical events from the perspective of people on the ground, 
everyday citizens, as well as those recorded as taking a leading part in the course of events. Bottom-up history instills a respect for and attention to people's lives, culture, and traditions. It demonstrates how, under the right circumstances, these aspects provide seeds for mass resistance. It shows how new political cultures, based on ideas and values, can come to emerge and become hegemonic and even, at times, emancipatory. This feature of the gathering force of demand for change, including the burgeoning movement of resistance from below, is an important element of the historiography of Ireland's independence. Struggle that, while not quite overlooked as a theme, would benefit from a further examination in order to give a fuller, richer, more comprehensive account of the lived experience of people as Ireland went from a war of independence to truce to treaty to civil war. The settlements, schisms, and civil strife that occurred in the years leading up to the foundation of the state. Today, this will be our focus as we hold our fourth Machnav 100 seminar. Machnav 100 is an initiative I have undertaken as Uktrona Heren to build on previous work to allow for reflections on the wider context of events including the War of Independence, Civil War, and Partition. I have invited leading scholars with diverse perspectives to share their insights on the context and events of that formative period of a century ago and on the nature of the act of commemoration itself. My motivation in convening Machnav 100 is to address the complexity of the period, to engage in the exploration of influences rather than the assertion of conclusions, and even less, the generation of demands. Our efforts are aimed at understanding, and I do believe that making such an effort in relation to the past assists in helping us to comprehend the adjustments we may choose to make in addressing our present complexities and our future challenges. May I thank Dr. John Bowman, historian and broadcaster, for agreeing to chair these seminars and for the excellent job he has done to date. And Professor Garrod Othuhig for his ongoing invaluable advice and assistance. Today, to discuss such themes in what is the fourth in a series of six Machnav seminars, we are fortunate to have with us distinguished scholars. The principal address will be given by Dr. Thomas Ferriger of University College Dublin. And respondents will be Professor Mary Daly and Professor Margaret Kelleher, both of University College Dublin, Dr. Dahi O'Coroin of Dublin City University, and Professor Fergal McGarry of Queen's University, Belfast. Our inaugural seminar held in December 2020 examined the nature and concept of commemoration itself in the context of today and of the national and global events of a century ago. Speakers included Professors Kieron Benson, Anne Dolan, Michael Laffin, and Joop Liersen, and myself. Together, we set out our intentions for what we are hoping to achieve from the series. In February of this year, I hosted a second seminar which focused on empire, imperial attitudes, and responses as they related to circumstances in Ireland. The main reflection was given by Professor John Horne, who provided an overview of the international context of the events in 1920s Ireland, including the fall of empires and the particular status of the British Empire. There were responses from Professor Eunan O'Halpin, Dr. Mary Coleman, Professor Alvin Jackson, Dr. Neve Gallagher, and myself. The third Martin of 100 seminar took place in May this year and was entitled Recovering Imagined Futures. This seminar focused on issues of land, social class, gender, and the sources of violence. And speakers included Dr. Margaret O'Callaghan, Ms. Katrina Crow, Dr. John Cunningham, Dr. Katrina Clear, Professor Linda Connolly, and myself. I hope you find today's seminar interesting, thought-provoking, perhaps even a further reminder of the value of transacting our shared history on this island. We now come to our keynote speaker, Dermot Ferreter, is Professor of Modern Irish History at UCD and is a prolific writer on 20th century Irish history. 
His books include The Transformation of Ireland, Occasions of Sin, Ambiguous Republic, The Border, and most recently, Between Two Hells, The Irish Civil War. He's a regular broadcaster, a columnist for the Irish Times, and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. His address to Machna of 100 is entitled Settlements, Schisms, and Civil Strife. Dear Mr. Parish. Agus a cold starha, is fleishur agus honor vordom the onsho inyov. Ba vallom ma vuiachas a cur anul don uchtoran, as quira a hort dun the onsho inyov. Agus as a vuil deanta aga, agus a ta fos a yen of aga, con na himachti a horle ked blin o hin, a chumara, agus dis spoiracht a spragach marialarhu. In August 1921. Jan Smuts, Prime Minister of the South African Union, a self-governing dominion of the British Empire, was in London on imperial business. Part of his mission was to try and persuade Eamon de Valera, President of Sinn Féin, to accept dominion status for Ireland within the British Empire, rather than insist on an Irish Republic. De Valera claimed such a question was for the Irish people to decide, and Smuts tellingly responded, the British people will never give you this choice. You are next door to them. Writing from the Savoy Hotel, Smuts also noted, to you, the Republic is the true expression of national self-determination, but it is not the only expression. The issues raised by Smuts returned to haunt de Valera and his colleagues in subsequent months, underlining one of the great divisions of 1921 and 1922 the gulf between those who could find flexibility in defining national self-determination and those who struggled to or resolutely refused to abandon unqualified republicanism. The settlement represented by the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921 forced a degree of introspection many were unused to, a requirement to reflect on what the label Irish Republic meant. For all its robustness as a rallying call, it was not deeply interrogated during the War of Independence. As historian Charles Townsend has noted, those who propelled the war were more focused on the idea of separation from Britain rather than implementing any concrete political program. Ideology does not feature strongly in most accounts of the war. And the new nationalist leaders did not see it as necessary to analyze the self that was to exercise self-determination. When he was interviewed in 1920 by the US journalist and British spy, Carl Ackerman, Michael Collins admitted, no one has ever defined a republic. By the summer of 1921, in view of the possibility of Anglo-Irish dialogue, Deliberate vagueness was also tactical. Prior to the treaty negotiations, on the 16th of August, Eamon de Valera told the second Doyle that the inauguration of the first Doyle in 1919 had been a vote for freedom and independence rather than for a particular form of government. Because in his words, we are not Republican doctrinaires. So what precisely were they? De Valera was afforded the title President of the Irish Republic by the Doyle in late August, which was partly a defensive reaction to the assertion of British Prime Minister David Lloyd George that an Irish Republic would not be countenanced by his government. Was De Valera, as he characterised Erskine Childers, an intellectual Republican? Or was he, as he put it in September, when defending his decision not to be part of the delegation to negotiate the treaty, the symbol of the Republic, desiring to be left apart from the negotiators as the symbol untouched. When de Valera corresponded with Frank Pakenham about this period in 1963 and referred to his external association proposals by which Ireland would be an independent country within the Commonwealth, associating with it for defence purposes and recognising the Crown as external head, he observed that he knew such proposals would probably be unacceptable to those whose political upbringing had been based on separatism. Was this de Valera distinguishing between himself and separatists? 
De Valera's decision to stay in Dublin led to another of the most significant divides of 100 years ago. That between the Sinn Féin negotiators in London and those who remained behind. While Robert Barton, one of the negotiating team, accepted de Valera's argument that he needed to be in a position uncontaminated by negotiations to reopen dialogue in case of a breakdown in talks, or to rally the people in the event of resistance, or to act as a kind of final court of appeal to avert whatever Britain might attempt to pull over. Barton thought his decision should have been reversed by the time we reach the final stage. Reaching that final stage was, of course, tortuous. Conferences, sub-conferences, prime ministerial skullduggery, exhaustion, theatrics, bluff, the scaring and soothing of Ulster unionists, and genuine effort at compromise all played their part. The stakes were high, as was the likelihood of failure. The chairman of the Irish delegation, Arthur Griffith, was under exceptional strain due to the oppressiveness of what de Valera referred to as the London atmosphere. Griffith was ultimately to become impaled on the Ulster Cross and perhaps hammered more nails into it than were necessary. But given the danger of offering hostages to fortune, the fault for the absence of a vigilant enough wordsmith surely lies with de Valera. And the archive of his excuses for not attending does not vindicate his assertion that the reasons for him staying away were, in his own words, overwhelming. He maintained, my intention was to be as close almost as if I were in London. But consider also his parallel observation. There was, to my mind, always the danger that those involved in the discussions would give to the words and phrases used in any document arising out of them such special and limited meaning as might not have been occurred or been attached to those words and phrases in the discussions themselves. Given de Valera's fastidious care with words and phrases, it is clear this was the kind of experience needed in London. Rather than just what de Valera referred to as Griffith's political experience and his republican aims. In any case, returning to an earlier question, to what extent did Griffith really have republican aims? Didn't de Valera also insist it was important to have Griffith there because he would have the confidence of the moderates? Griffith was no republican ideologue, and in the words of his biographer, Owen McGee, took umbrage at any attempt to place labels upon him. He was largely driven by the need to challenge British economic manipulations and wanted Ireland to look outside the UK to understand its place and potential in the world. In tandem, de Valera made the assertion that while the negotiations were held, at home waited a determined people ready to accept a renewal of the war. That was a dubious contention. Of 2,344 people who died in Ireland due to political violence between January 1917 and December 1921, 919, or 39% of them, were civilians. The arrogance of de Valera in wanting to stay at home yet fully participate in the negotiations led to growing frustration as was apparent in correspondence in October and November, including in relation to the powers of the delegates. In late October, Griffith made it clear to the British side he had no authority to accept the Crown, but that if they could reach accommodation on the essential unity of Ireland, he could recommend some form of association with the Crown. De Valera responded, we are all here at one, that there can be no question of allegiance to Crown and if war is the alternative, we can only face it. And I think the sooner the other side is made to realize that, the better. That prompted a thunderous reply from the delegates. Obviously, they wrote, any form of association 
necessitates discussion of recognition in some form or other of the head of the association. Our instructions conferred this power of discussion, but required before a decision was made reference to the members of the cabinet in Dublin. The powers were given by the cabinet as a whole and can only be withdrawn or varied by the cabinet as a whole. We strongly resent in the position in which we are placed the interference with our powers. The responsibility, if this interference breaks the very slight possibility there is of settlement, will not and must not rest on the plenipotentiaries. Ultimately, it was British rather than Irish draft papers that drove the negotiations. The determination to only break off the negotiations if the Ulster question was unresolved was not maintained, as instead the link with the Crown became the focus. Lloyd George's secretary, Tom Jones, suggested the response of the Irish delegates to a draft treaty, including proposed new wording about the link with the Crown, was so worded as to leave the position far too ambiguous and uncertain. Lloyd George decided this is of no use. The irony, however, was that when it came to the clauses relating to the proposed Boundary Commission to review the border, they too were deliberately vague. Jones had previously spoken to Griffith alone and suggested that if Sinn Féin cooperated with Lloyd George's Boundary Commission strategy, we might have Ulster in before many months had passed. The impression created of such a commission during the talks, as also recorded by Jones, was that it would involve so cutting down Ulster that she would be forced in from economic necessity. Meanwhile, James Craig, as Prime Minister of the new Northern Ireland, spoke of the betrayal of unionists because of the inclusion of the Boundary Commission Clause and wrote to Lloyd George after the treaty was signed, reminding him that he had promised on the 25th of November that the rights of Ulster will be in no way sacrificed or compromised. At our meeting on December the 9th, you complained that it was only intended to make a slight readjustment of our boundary line so as to bring into Northern Ireland loyalists who are now just outside our area and to transfer correspondingly an equivalent number of those having Sinn Féin sympathies to the area of the Irish Free State. But since then, members of the British government had given encouragement to those endeavouring to read into it a different interpretation. The contention of Griffith that the promised boundary commission amounted to a commitment to plebiscites was naive and delusional, but it was deliberate ambiguity that allowed for settlement. Lloyd George, as he remarked mid-negotiations, was after a settlement. And he got one. But it was a wild exaggeration to maintain, as British historian AJP Taylor later did, that a terrible chapter in British history was closed. The Irish question had baffled and ruined the greatest statesman. Lloyd George conjured it out of existence. Taylor was correct in contending, of course, times favoured him. Men were bored with the Irish question. But Lloyd George had not conjured it out of existence, or as he put it himself, got rid of it. It had just been kicked down the road or down a long 300 mile border. During the treaty debates over the course of 15 days between December 1921 and January 1922, TD spoke of sovereignty, partition, social justice, legitimacy, betrayal, Loyalty, honour, conscience, violence, and Ireland's international relations. They did not dwell too deeply on ideology. There were few references to class issues, and the TDs were broadly representative of the upwardly mobile Catholic middle class. The text of the treaty debates runs to 440,000 words, and these words matter in seeking to understand the political mindsets of a century ago, the depth of convictions, the nature of decisions, and the rationale behind settlements. Cork TD Mary McSweeney pointedly stated 
in contrast to de Valera's assertion in August that she was a doctrinaire Republican, while Galway TD Frank Fahey asked, have we just been playing at Republicanism? The divisions between McSweeney and de Valera also played out in exasperated, sometimes fond, and often emotive personal correspondence. De Valera admitted he could not, unlike McSweeney, keep on the plane of faith and unreason and maintain that position consciously. He clearly struggled to make common cause with some of those on the same side of the treaty divide as him, a reminder that the divisions of 1922 were not just between those who had voted for and against the treaty, but within those two blocks. Writer George Russell, AE, was later to maintain both sides embraced the one-dimensional mind, beaten by the hammer of Thor into some mold or shape when they cling to one idea. Likewise, historians and political scientists in subsequent decades sought to make much of the chasm. At the time of the 50th anniversary of the treaty, Leland Lyons warned of the perils that lie in wait when men fall under the sway of ideology. In contrast to those who he suggested, in the midst of exhaustion and having won relatively good terms, arguably had a moral duty to sign. His analysis was clearly coloured by the outbreak of the Troubles, or the extent to which, in his words, the dire past was still overhanging the dire present. Decades later, Tom Garvin's reflections as the 75th anniversary of the treaty approached were more strident, pinpointing 1922 as the birth of Irish democracy. Garvin argued that moderate and realistic nation builders had triumphed over militant Republicans contemptuous of democratic principles of legitimacy. The pro-treaty leaders were unconditional Democrats and they killed people for the nascent Irish democracy that they saw menaced by the anti-treatyites who saw the Republic as a transcendental moral entity. Such a hero and villain school of interpretation is inadequate. A point forcefully underlined by David Fitzpatrick in 2011 when he wisely advised those commemorating the revolutionary period to avoid the use of simplistic and exclusive dichotomies or facile attributions of motive. His stance, I suspect, was strongly influenced by his sustained engagement with the life of Harry Boland, who he characterized as at once a dictator, an elitist, a populist, and a democrat. Whether we consider that he was driven by a laudable conviction in the inalienable rights of nations or a grotesque delusion, the sincerity of his struggle cannot be impugned. Are we too prone to characterizing those on opposite sides of the treaty debates as entrenched in their certainty and righteousness? And what of those who wavered in between or opted out of the subsequent civil war? In 2015, historian Jimmy Wren traced the political progression of some veterans of the 1916 Rising. Of 572 people identified as active with the general post office garrison, the largest single proportion, 41%, were neutral during the Civil War. Others grew tired of dogmatism and began to feel detached. Writer Frank O'Connor, for example, initially resolute, saying of himself, I rarely thought, I felt, came to decry those who insisted the Irish Republic was still in existence and would remain so despite what its citizens might think. Out of the fray, he went into himself deeply and took advantage of enforced solitude to listen to his interior voices. He did not want martyrdom as too many mythical abstractions reduced life to a tedious morality. Patriotism was both an expensive currency and a contested, confused concept in Ireland in 1922. And no side of the treaty divide or the civil war had a monopoly of it. But Frank O'Connor's reference to what the people might think also raises the question of the extent to which 
Many TDs were unrepresentative of the country at large. And some of the Republicans came under intense pressure from angry constituents. Sean McEntee admitted the unanimous wish of Monaghan was that I should vote for the treaty, but he did not. Likewise, Harry Boland referred to the chorus of approval for the treaty from his constituents in Roscommon. But this only heightened, as he saw it, the contrast between his own reliance on conscience and the hypocrisy of his opponents, who signed the treaty with a mental reservation that it is not a final settlement. Mental reservation, however, was also employed by the anti-treatyites a few years later when entering the Free State Doyle. Deep emotion was on display because friendships were fraying. Boland, according to David Fitzpatrick, never abandoned the dream of negotiating the growing political and military split to the restoration of fraternal unity. Even for those who turned away in disgust, 1922 marked them. Liam O'Brien, incarcerated for much of the second half of the War of Independence, supported the treaty and took no part in the Civil War. But 1922 left him, in his own words, a permanently disappointed man. We also, I think, need to consider quieter reflections alongside the grandiose rhetoric. O'Brien was very much under the spell of Arthur Griffith. But as he saw it, the unremitting intensity of Griffith's patriotism had to be felt in quiet social intercourse to be believed rather than on big public occasions. Those caught up in the emotion of the treaty divide did not necessarily do justice to their own complexity. And one of the consequences of the propaganda that hardened was that the questions and the answers became too conveniently short and polarized. And what of the divisions between soldiers and politicians? Cahill Brewer pointedly referred during the treaty debates to the men who count. Calton Younger's History of the Civil War in 1968 argued the Irish Civil War ought to have been fought with words on the floor of the Doyle, and it could have been. Perhaps it could have been in a fantasy post-Treaty Ireland, where the Doyle was the prime national and final arbiter. But that regard did not exist in 1922. As Liam Lynch soon to be Chief of Staff of the Anti-Treaty IRA characterised it, up to 75% of IRA members opposed the treaty, though not all of them would take up arms against it. They had not been adequately prepared for compromise. In any case, some IRA members regarded politics as moribund or irrelevant and saw themselves as in charge. In historian Peter Hart's words, the guerrillas thought of themselves as sovereign. They had brought the Republic into being. Nobody else had the right to give it away. If the Doyle was going to jettison that declared Republic, the IRA was not required to be answerable to it. And, as Liam Lynch stated emphatically, the army had to hew the way to freedom for politics to follow. Let us understand rather than dismiss that contention. It was violence that had got the British to negotiate, and the 1916 rebels had not waited for endorsement from the Republic. And let us return to the Smuts letter in August and his words about choice. In April 1922, Winston Churchill, as Secretary of State for the Colonies, told the provisional government seeking to implement the treaty that it must assert itself or perish and be replaced by some other form of control. It was a typical Churchillian bullying flourish and a reminder of the British shadow and threat that hung over Ireland in 1922. That the Civil War was not just an internal Irish matter. With the British assisted attack on anti-treaty IRA members in Dublin at the end of June 1922 that began the Civil War, was it Churchill's policy rather than an Irish policy that had effectively triumphed? And could the Irish general election that same month, during which pro-treaty candidates prevailed, be seen as fully free, given the lingering British pressure? Many Northern nationalists felt abandoned, and the division between South and North was
was a heavy burden for them to carry. As was the scale of the violence that caused 557 deaths there between July 1920 and July 1922. Arguably, the mental partition predated the physical one. Indeed, Charles Townshend's recent history of partition contends the Doyle's attitude to Ulster oddly resembled the baffled indifference to Ireland so long evident at Westminster. As de Valera put it in a private Doyle session on the 15th of December in offering his alternative to the treaty, the difficulty is not the Ulster question. As far as we are concerned, this is a fight between Ireland and England. I want to eliminate the Ulster question out of it. We will take the same things as agreed on there. Leading Ulster Sinn Féinor, Claire Healy, came to share the belief that the proposed Boundary Commission would deliver, but he was also conscious that this rested on thin ice and complained of no light or leading from Dublin and that none of the Sinn Féin leaders understood what he called the northern situation or the northern mind. Within six months, he found himself interned on the prison ship Argenta in Belfast, feeling tormented and betrayed. Derry's Joseph O'Doherty, active in the IRA there and in Donegal, and also Sinn Féin TD for North Donegal, had warned the Sinn Féin executive before the treaty not to allow unionist control over, in his words, things affecting life, liberty and civil rights, or our grievance will be against Ireland generally for her desertion of her Highlanders. And yet, James Craig, while determined to make the North impregnable, was perhaps less sure privately than his public rhetoric would suggest. Craig met Michael Collins in January 1922 at his own initiative to discover his future intentions towards Ulster. Cabinet papers record that for three hours he was alone with Mr Collins and made it clear to him that for the present an All-Ireland Parliament was out of the question. Possibly in years to come, 10, 20 or 50 years, Ulster might be tempted to join with the South. Collins said he had so many troubles in Southern Ireland that he was prepared to establish cordial relations with Northern Ireland, hoping to coax her into a union later. From the inception of the Government of Ireland Act to its passage by Parliament in late 1920, the official line was always that its essential principle was not division, but union. But the Council of Ireland to assist that never, in the words of Townsend, cast off its air of forlorn hope. Ulster unionism hardened and failed to adapt or mature, while British governments of different hues deliberately turned blind eyes to the reality of sectarian discrimination in Northern Ireland. The British Labour Party bogusly insisted in 1925 that the Irish question was one that was practically settled. The Civil War had further dissipated hope and enfeebled Ulster Republicans. As one of them put it about the prioritization of Southern objectives in 1922, we were sadly disappointed. We had started something which we could not hope to carry out successfully alone. Antrim volunteers during the Civil War, he lamented, filtered back to be arrested or allowed to resume their ordinary lives under stringent enemy conditions. Some, he also noted, were able to return to their homes later, but the majority were forced to find employment in other parts of Ireland or abroad. Clearly, the Civil War had compounded their isolation, captured in the stinging assertion, we never knew if our position was clearly understood in Dublin. Leland Lyons was accurate in maintaining in 1972 that most people, I suspect, do not live by the hard, clear light of abstract dogmas explicitly stated. But some who did were unfairly pilloried, none more so than the women who were militantly anti-treaty. What was it that prompted Cork Sinn Féin TD Liam de Roista to record in his diary in late 1922 of Mary McSweeney? I do not regard her 
or some of the other women engaged in public affairs as normal beings with normal human mentality. They are monomaniacs. There is a moral sore in the soul of Ireland. Sheila Humphreys, one of the Civil War prisoners released after a 31-day hunger strike, left us with this image. We were flattened. We felt the Irish public had forgotten us. The tinted trappings of our fight were hanging like rags about us. Leland Lyons also approvingly quoted Kevin O'Higgins' assertion during the treaty debates that the welfare of the people must take precedence of political creed and theories. But did it? For academic Liam O'Brien, there was some comfort to be found in what he described as 42 years of peaceful professorship. He was one of the fortunate ones. And here is where we get one of the great divisions. For those without a stake in the country and on the loser's side, a bleakness calcified. And for far too many, the civil war's afterlife was brutally disordered and fractured at a time when an insecure and inexperienced elite found itself presiding over a population that wanted unheroic things. This is where the voluminous archive of the military service pension files becomes so illuminating. About both a well-meaning effort to compensate those bereft, but also the cruel lotteries in operation. A government memorandum in 1957 revealed that 82,000 people applied for pensions under the main 1924 and 1934 Pensions Acts. Of these, 15,700 were successful and 66,300 were rejected. How to define active service remained contested and contentious. Consider too the fate of those bereaved and the gulf they felt existed between the cause that had been died for and the reality of their post-1922 existence. Women faced additional barriers. Nora Martin, a leading light in Common Amman in Cork, castigated the exclusively male overseers of the pensions process for failing to do justice to the claims of Common Amman veterans. They risked their jobs, their homes, and their lives, she wrote. In justice to them, one woman at least should be on that advisory board. Lawyers and civil servants, no matter how sympathetic, can never visualize the feelings of these women during the period 1920 to 1924. Martin was writing on behalf of Ellen Carroll, active with Common Amman in Cork during the Civil War through intelligence and dispatch work, which compromised her health due to regular soakings. Carol was diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1924 and spent three months in a sanatorium. She was described by the end of the Civil War as a complete wreck. She was turned down for a disability pension and eventually, after an appeal, received a miserly grade E service pension in 1943. Working in a sorting office in Shepherd's Bush as London endured the Blitz, her letters to Nora Martin, under whose direction she had served in Common Amman, depicted her mental demise. From hour to hour, you are only waiting for death. It is just hell on earth. I must say, I am very unlucky and think I am stuck over here for this, but I may thank the Irish government for that. I could be home now if they granted me that service pension. In 1942, the list of the contemporary positions of John O'Neill's fellow 1922 anti-treaty IRA column members in Cork made for stark reading. Dead, 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 USA, 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 dead. Following an appeal, O'Neill was awarded a grade D military pension of just under 80 pounds for almost eight years service, and eventually a disability pension of 150 pounds per annum. In 1935, he reminded fellow Civil War veteran Tom Hales 
elected a Fianna Fáil TD for West Cork in 1933, that from 1916 on, I was never able to sleep one night in my own home until 1923. Ten years after the end of the Civil War, and only seven years after his marriage, now a father of three children, John was suffering breathlessness on exertion, weakness, spitting of blood, and inability to do work of any kind. He had severe heart disease, but he still had to engage in protracted correspondence with the Minister for Defence. I am a complete wreck, he wrote, living with three children on 10 acres of ground. I ask you in the name of honour, in fair play, and as far as charity's sake. 14 months after a medical examination had established 100% disability, a decision had still not been reached. And he wondered, how in God's name can I pay my doctor? At the age of 49, John O'Neill died of chronic endocarditis, cirrhosis of liver, disease attributable to service in the IRA. The shadow cast by the death of Edward Stapleton, a National Army soldier killed at Knocknagoshel in Kerry in March 1923, was also distressing. From Lower Gloucester Street in Dublin, he was a foreman at Easton's bookseller. His mother, Julia, aged 66, in poor health and having lost two other children to illness, was trying to survive on her daughter-in-law Mary's allowance and living with her and her two infant grandsons. In May 1924, Julia got a weekly allowance of one pound, while Mary was awarded 90 pounds per annum, with a yearly allowance of 24 pounds for each child until they reached 18. There was yet further tragedy, however, in 1926, when Edward and Mary's youngest son died, aged just five. The Army Finance Office made sure to recoup the overpayment of one pound, 17 shillings and five pence that had been made for the month after the child's death. As he faced death in the 1950s, IRA veteran Ernie O'Malley recorded that the British were no longer his enemies. Each man finds his enemy within himself, he wrote. He was able to explore and write about that personal interior deeply, helped by an annual military service pension of 258 pounds from 1934 and an annual disability pension of 120 pounds, which was hard earned. The National Army soldier killed during O'Malley's capture in Dublin in 1922 was Peter McCartney, the eldest of nine children aged from 10 to 23 at the time of his death from a farm comprising 30 acres of poor land in Leitrim. In 1923, his father, Patrick, was awarded a 40 pounds gratuity for Peter's death. As a self-described poor man, he pleaded in 1925, 1926 and 1927 for more when he had no employment. People having plenty of money, he wrote, seldom think of the poor. My son left his employment for the freedom of the state. As an 86 year old in 1955, Patrick was still corresponding with the pension authorities to be told the 40 pounds from 1923 was in full and final settlement of your claim. We need to appreciate and understand the depth of conviction that drove people in Ireland in the early 1920s, but also how for too many, the idealism became so cruelly compromised. Thank you, Dermot. We will now hear responses to Professor Ferreter's paper from our four invited scholars and then from President Higgins. And we then have a roundtable discussion. Virgil McGarry is Professor of Modern Irish History at Queen's University Belfast. He's written widely on revolutionary and post-independence Ireland and he's the author of The Abbey Rebels of 1916, A Lost Revolution and The Rising Ireland Easter 1916 and is currently engaged in a number of cooperative works studying the Irish Revolution as shaped by the wider world. 
and has been extensively involved in the decade of centenaries. Fergal McGarry. Uktoin, uh, Akarja. It's a great honour to address Machnaf 100. Professor Farrater began by raising two questions central to understanding the conflicts and settlements of 1921 to 1922. Why were so many Irish revolutionaries committed to a republic rather than some lesser form of independence? And what did they understand the republic to mean? Thinking about how the world was changing in the aftermath of the First World War provides useful insights into both questions. I want to develop three arguments here. First, that the global context is central to understanding the rhetoric, aims, and strategies of Irish Republicans during the revolution. Second, that international developments shaped the settlements imposed on Ireland in important ways. Third, that these global influences, particularly the impact of the First World War on ideas about sovereignty and empire, have contemporary relevance as we commemorate these centenaries. Easter 1916 was central to the emergence of republicanism as a popular movement. The legacy of the rebellion, as much emotional as ideological, saw the cause of the republic unite almost every faction of advanced nationalism by 1917, when Sinn Féin adopted the republic as its goal. Despite a long tradition of republican thought among Irish insurrectionaries, the decision to proclaim a republic in 1916 probably owed more to the international wartime context as well as the model provided by the United States, which five of the proclamation's seven signatories had visited. When Min Ryan asked Tom Clark in the GPO why the Rising had gone ahead under such unfavorable circumstances, Clark had told her that a rebellion was necessary to make Ireland's position felt at the peace conference so that its relation to the British Empire would strike the world. When she asked him why a republic, Clark explained, you must have something striking in order to appeal to the imagination of the world. So global events and global opinion were central to the rebels' thinking. Although it seemed quixotic to many in 1916, the Republic was an idea whose time had seemed to come by 1919, when, following the collapse of the great empires, republics rapidly became the norm across Europe. Sinn Féin, as Dermot has noted, did not outline a clear sense of what the Irish Republic might entail, but it did propose a remarkably clear strategy of how it would be achieved. The party identified four means to secure a republic in its 1918 election manifesto. Abstention from Westminster, political agitation, the establishment of an Irish parliament and a counter state, and an appeal for recognition to the Paris Peace Conference. Sinn Féin's appeal to a peace conference that had declared its intention to organize, quote, the future of the nations of the world on the principle of government by consent of the governed was astute. Republicans and imperialists alike understood the potentially incendiary implications of President Wilson's 14-point speech, which seemed to herald a new world order based on national self-determination and the rule of international law rather than military might. Towards the end of the First World War, Britain and France had even felt it necessary to affirm, albeit insincerely, that governments should derive, quote, their authority from the initiative and free choice of the indigenous population. In demanding a republic, Irish revolutionaries believed history was on their side. In the weeks prior to the 1918 general election, republics had been proclaimed in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. Sinn Féin's election leaflets highlighted how its demands had been achieved by other peoples. Poland free, an object lesson for Ireland. Poland is now Sinn Féin. Declaring independence, as Republicans did when the Doyle first met in January 1919, was one thing. Achieving it, another. Whereas the Irish party's efforts to win self-government had centred on Westminster, Irish Republicans saw international recognition as the means to achieve independence. The Irish Declaration of Independence, intended for a global as much as an Irish audience, demanded the recognition and support of every free nation in the world. The Doyle's message to the free nations of the world called upon every free nation to support the Irish Republic by recognizing Ireland's national status and her rights to its vindication at the Peace Congress. In retrospect, 
what is striking about early 1919, the period we now remember as the start of the War of Independence, was the extent to which propaganda and politics, rather than violence, were central to Republican strategy. For many in Sinn Féin, the shootings at Solohead Beg on the same day that the Doyle first met came as an unwelcome distraction from the performance orchestrated at the Mansion House before an audience of international press correspondents. But in practical, as opposed to propaganda terms, the peace conference strategy was clearly flawed. The big four powers that determined its outcome were never likely to side against one of their own with a movement that had identified with its gallant German allies in 1916. Self-determination, moreover, was intended for the oppressed nations of the defeated empires rather than those of its victors. So rather than the Poles or the Czechs, the position of the Irish was in some ways more analogous to the anti-colonial nationalists who were similarly excluded from the peace conference. With their hopes initially raised and then dashed by what Arez Manela has described as the Wilsonian moment, Indian and Egyptian revolutionaries, the countries with which Ireland was most frequently compared abroad, embarked on similar campaigns. They rejected offers of limited self-government, protested at home and abroad, and drew on Wilsonian rhetoric to articulate long-standing grievances in drawn-out campaigns that eventually led to partial independence. And surveying Irish efforts within this context, what is perhaps most striking is the extent to which similar strategies were used by nationalist revolutionaries across the world. For example, it was not only the Irish, but also the Koreans who declared independence in 1919, established a Republican government, appealed to the peace conference, sent revolutionary diplomats to Washington, mobilized diasporic support, issued revolutionary bonds in the US, and organized presidential tours across America. What most marked out the Irish among these other movements was the relative size and influence of its diaspora, a product of the post-famine migration that had scattered almost two million people across the globe, but most conveniently, had been sent, concentrated in the new global superpower that was the US. Consequently, the Irish were perhaps the best connected and most influential of the international revolutionary movements, who had been disappointed by the failure to secure recognition at Paris. Not for nothing did President Wilson blame the Irish for wrecking his presidency when he failed to win domestic political support for membership of the League of Nations. So how did these international factors shape the settlements that brought the Irish conflict to an end? I would argue that the way we remember and commemorate the independence struggle places more emphasis than is warranted on the domestic and the military dimensions of a campaign that prioritized political struggle, revolutionary diplomacy, and international propaganda. As Michael Collins advised the Doyle's representative in Rome, Real progress is much more to be estimated by what is thought abroad than by what is thought at home. The commander in chief in Ireland, General Neville McCready, similarly acknowledged that this propaganda business is the strongest weapon Sinn Féin has. Even military events within Ireland, such as the sacking of Cork by the Black and Tans, were as significant for their international consequences as their impact at home. British actions in Ireland provoked dismay and outrage, including within England, whilst international press coverage devastated Britain's global reputation. The mobilisation of the Irish diaspora ensured that events at home resonated across the world, ensuring that the Irish question transcended narrow ethnic politics. One striking example of this was the impact of the hunger strike by Terence McSweeney, who became a global icon whose cause prompted international protests and strikes involving anti-imperial, anti-colonial, socialist, suffrage, and trade union movements. Despite Irish-American racism and the tendency of some Irish Republicans to base their claim to self-government in part on their whiteness, such displays of solidarity included prominent black rights activists such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey as has been explored recently by scholars such as Brian Hanley, David Brundage, and Miriam Nyan Gray. 
Imperialists, like Republicans, also believed that the Irish question was rooted in broader struggles. Sir Henry Wilson, chief of the Imperial General Staff, linked the challenge from Irish Republicans with labour unrest across Britain, Bolshevism, and anti-colonial agitation across the empire. Britain, he noted in his diary, is fighting New York and Cairo and Calcutta and Moscow, who are only using Ireland as a tool and lever against England, and nothing but determined shooting on our part is any use. Imagined or real, these connections shaped British decision-making as to how the Irish war should be conducted and concluded, with the implications for imperial rule in Egypt and India frequently cited by figures such as Wilson, who declared, if we lose Ireland, we have lost the empire. For many British politicians, as Maurice Walsh has noted, among the most discomforting feature of events in Ireland was that tactics of imperial repression, usually concealed, were now being documented and described in the daily press. The condemnation of reprisals by conservative as well as liberal British newspapers prompted concerns about the morality and the efficacy of David Lloyd George's Irish policy, undermining his government's resolve to sustain its counter-insurrectionary campaign in Ireland despite increasing military success in the final months of the conflict. An awareness that it was losing the propaganda war, not least in America, helps to explain the British government's humiliating decision to negotiate with the leaders of a movement it had only recently condemned as a murder gang. The settlements that followed were similarly shaped by international pressures and imperial calculations. The fateful decision to devolve power to a unionist-controlled northern state, rather than merely exclude Ulster from an Irish settlement, which had been the plan before the First World War, resulted in part from a desire to be seen to conform to the new gospel of self-determination. Like the treaty settlement to follow, partition was shaped by concerns about other troublesome parts of the empire, such as Palestine and Egypt, where a new terminology of mandates and dominions was coined to enable nationalist aspirations for independence to be contained within reconfigured imperial frameworks. And wider shifts in liberal political thought, as Ari Dubnoff has observed, shaped the appeal of partition as a means for resolving national differences, crucially within imperial structures. The unmixing of peoples through the creation of national self-governing states was regarded positively by the international community, as was demonstrated by the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne, where the redrawing of borders was accompanied by mass population transfers. Irish partition, or more specifically, the perceived success of Irish partition, influenced Britain's partition plans in Palestine and later in India. And it was only after the Second World War that it was widely conceded that partition was, in fact, a violent process that intensified rather than resolved conflict over identities and the mistreatment of minorities within these newly created partition states. The Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 was similarly shaped by international factors and imperial considerations. Pressure from the US and British Empire contributed to London's decision to concede an Irish dominion, a form of statehood that was defined in the treaty's first article agreement as having the same constitutional status as Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. As Dermot has noted, imperial figures such as the South African statesman Jan Smuts, through their influence on the king, helped to facilitate the treaty settlement. And through the leverage provided by its diaspora, Irish Republicans had influenced Britain's Irish policy and that settlement. Explaining to British MPs the necessity for the unpopular concession of dominion status to Ireland, Winston Churchill noted how Britain's, quote, great interests in India and in Egypt, the dominions and the United States had been damaged by the loud, insistent outcry raised by the Irish race all over the world. In his influential, influential Caird Hall speech 
advocating a treaty that extended his government to the utmost limit possible, Churchill argued that it would not only be a blessing in itself inestimable, but would, it would be removed the greatest obstacle which has ever existed to Anglo-American unity. Far across the Atlantic Ocean, we should reap a harvest sown in the Emerald Isle. As Heather Jones has observed, both the King's speech at the opening of the Northern Irish Parliament and the British debates on the Irish Treaty demonstrate the shift in British imperial ideas that was occurring not just in, but through Ireland. As George V noted during his visit to open the Belfast Parliament, everything which touches Ireland finds an echo in the remotest parts of the empire. So the Irish were negotiating self-government at a time of rapid transition for the British Empire. For many Irish revolutionaries, political developments since Easter 1916 had made the notion of an oath of allegiance to a British monarch unthinkable because a particular form of state, the Republic, had become synonymous with independence. But at the same time, for many British politicians, the role of the monarch as the crucial element that would bind together the community of nations transitioning from an empire ruled by London to a less hierarchical commonwealth of nations, a term whose first legal use occurs in the Anglo-Irish Treaty, was too important to allow for compromise on an oath to the king. So these transnational developments in thought and politics helped to explain the difficulty of fashioning a treaty settlement acceptable to both Irish Republicans and British imperialists, and consequently the drift to civil war that ensued. Ultimately, Britain's insistence on the role of the monarch and empire in the treaty proved a Pyrrhic victory, delegitimising in the eyes of many Irish nationalists the Irish Free State that was established in 1922. Fifteen years later, by 1937, both treaty and free state had been scrapped. Ironically, this was achieved because of the success with which the Irish Free State worked with other so-called restless dominions to assert its legislative independence. And of course, there's a tragic dimension to these developments, given that the treaty debate centred on whether that settlement would forever lock Ireland into imperial subjugation or permit a peaceful evolution to full independence. What relevance does Ireland's global revolution have for commemoration? Exploring the Irish conflict beyond the island emphasises the importance of political ideas in shaping the revolution, something that's often less evident from historical and commemorative focus on the domestic and in particular on the military dimensions of the War of Independence. It reminds us how the Irish question, for a brief period, galvanised international attention symbolising, as it did, broader transformations as imperial and colonial world orders slowly gave ground to more democratic and egalitarian forms of statehood. Finally, consideration of the importance of ideas such as self-determination and empire should complicate commemoration, given that the legacy of these conflicts in the form of a partitioned island with a contested border continues to shape our present rather than constituting a past that can be safely consigned to history. Underlying the commemorative strategy of the Irish state is the idea of the decade of centenaries as marking a tragic period of shared history shaped by people from multiple identities and traditions requiring egalitarian remembrance. Although well-meaning, commemorations that prioritise present-day reconciliation over interrogation of the ideas and agency that shaped the struggles and enmities of the revolutionary era may end up contributing little to either reconciliation or historical understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Fergal. Mary E. Daly is our next speaker, Professor Emeritus in Irish History at UCD, a member of the expert advisory group on the decade of centenaries, and she was president of the Royal Irish Academy from 2014 to 2017. Mary Daly. Thank you, John. It's more on Ohustun Sub than Sean Yu. And I really want to compliment the President for initiating and inspiring this series of reflections as part of the Decade of Centenaries. Um, before 
exploring the difficult and divisive issues relating to the treaty and the subsequent civil war, I think it'd be helpful for a moment to reflect on what remarkable achievement the all Ireland secured in getting a ceasefire and a treaty with Britain, which was then one of the most powerful nations in the world. The very limited devolution that was offered in the 1914 Home Rule Act would have left an Irish Home Rule Assembly with significantly less powers than today's Scottish Assembly. By contrast, the 1921 treaty gave the new state dominion status, which had an external guarantee that it was similar to that of Canada. And this was given at a time when the dominions were expanding and securing much greater autonomy than they had ever enjoyed before. And Ireland was a beneficiary of that expanding autonomy, as Fergal and McGarry has indicated. The treaty also granted full fiscal freedom, which was certainly not on offer remotely in 1912-1914. And this was highly significant, probably a, a, a deal breaker for Arthur Griffith, because it was something that he had long campaigned for as essential if the Irish economy was to develop as its full potential. The 1914 Home Rule Act and the 1921 Treaty both evaded the thorniest issue of all, that is Ulster. Both left the long-term settlement in terms of borders and or all-island governments arrangements for a later determination. But I think we can argue that the remarkable su success of the Irish campaign, both domestically and, as Fergal has emphasised internationally, may have led to a certain hubris, a belief that anything was possible, including an Irish Republic, however that was defined. All negotiations involved compromises, and de Valera appears to have recognised that. Notably in a speech which he gave when he was in the United States in 1920, where he suggested that Ireland would accept a variant of the American Monroe Doctrine. In other words, that because of Ireland's geographical proximity to Britain, it would ensure that an independent Ireland would take account of Britain's defensive interests and never be used to threaten that. De Valera's proposal of external association was a further attempt to reconcile the Irish aspirations to independence with the British demands to retain a continuing association with the Crown. But as Dermot has emphasised, De Valera sat on the sidelines during the treaty negotiations, and it's unclear that the Irish delegation fully comprehended or accepted the external association option. There's no evidence that members of Dáil Éireann or the rank and file of the IRA were remotely aware that the negotiations would involve some compromises by the Irish delegation, and neither was there any detailed discussion among the Dáil Ministry as to what form these compromises might take. Although Dáil Éireann existed as a legislative assembly from January 1919, the meetings were very irregular, they were poorly attended, and that's not surprising because for much of its existence, the members, many members were in prison or on the run or the doll itself was prescribed. But it would have been possible to schedule a number of discussions, debates on these topics following the truce in the summer of 1921. And the doll did hold private sessions, so they didn't necessarily have to be open to the public or the media. Such sessions might have injected a much needed measure of realism into the expectations for the forthcoming negotiations. There were many signals, public and more private, that Britain would never countenance a republic, that it would insist on residual ties, particularly to the crown and the empire. And as Fergus has explained, this was an important issue, not just for British-Irish relations, but for the whole future of the British empire. There was also a need to recognise that the Irish delegates were facing a team of very experienced statesmen whose negotiating skills had been honed at the Paris peace talks. They're playing effectively against the world champions of negotiations at this point. Britain, unlike Ireland, had worked out what they were prepared to concede and what was non-negotiable. Furthermore, while Dáil and Éireann and the struggle for independence had, as Fergal again emphasised, secured widespread international attention and sympathy, Russia was the only country that had recognised the new state, and Russia at this stage was a complete, uh, 
was, 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 was a rogue state, uh, not recognised uh, or acknowledged by many of the key players. The failure to have an Irish independence placed on the agenda at the Paris Peace Conference indicated there was little prospect of securing international recognition, let alone support, for an Irish Republic that was established in defiance of Britain. Symbols mattered immensely to both sides. We're into an area of symbolism and emotion rather than reason on many issues. For Britain, the crown was paramount, though frankly, in the early 1920s, the precise nature of the monarch's practical authority was very ill-defined, but the symbolism really mattered. Likewise, the Republic, equally ill-defined, but a term that conjured up the sacrifices of the 1916 leaders was non-negotiable for many of the old deputies, and for IRA members, and many members of Common Amman. When the committee that was charged with drafting a constitution for the Irish Free State tried to reconcile these conflicting principles by excluding references to the treaty in the draft constitution, excluding also the oath of allegiance and the monarchy, and including a clause stating that all powers of government are derived from the people of Ireland, which is an implicitly republican form of language, Britain insisted the constitution be rewritten to incorporate the terms of the treaty. The irony is that within a decade, almost all the residual powers of the British government and monarchy over the Irish Free State had vanished, and in the 1940s, an independent Indian Republic was established, which remained and remains today a member of the Commonwealth. This is a case of external association for slow learners. Leaving Ulster aside for a moment, the clause in the treaty which had the greatest potential to constrain an independent Ireland was Britain's retention of three naval bases. If that had not been resolved by 1938, Irish neutrality would have been impossible in World War II. But the implications of those bases for an independent Irish foreign policy was not widely discussed during the treaty debates, except by Erskine Childers. And likewise, the question of Ulster and a boundary commission only took approximately 10% of the treaty debates, of interest only to TDs with strong Ulster connections like Sean McEntee or Ernest Blythe. The extensive treaty debates and how the individual deputies voted have been subjected to detailed analysis by many historians who sought to explain the reasons why some deputies voted the way they did. It's clear that these decisions were extremely complex. They cannot be explained by references to geography, social class, age, or any of the normal variables used by social scientists. There was only one coherently identifiable voting bloc, all six women TDs voted against the treaty. Some of the male deputies who supported the treaty dismissed the women as mere ciphers for dead male heroes, a criticism that fails to acknowledge that with the possible exception of Margaret Pierce, who was mother of Patrick and Willie, the women in question had proven records of involvement in the campaign for independence. They were not ciphers. The views expressed by the six women deputies were shared by a much wider cohort of women who were members of Common Amman. There were 77 women interned in the aftermath of the 1916 rising, but there were approximately 600 women interned a, in the, during the Civil War, which suggests that there was a remarkable increase in female activism in the years between 1916 and 1921 and also that the women were concentrated disproportionately on the anti-treaty side. Now, some of those women are very well known, Hani Sheehy, Scavington, Mary McSweeney, Constant Markovitz, to name a few. Many of those women have been forgotten, and I think we need to understand them better. Their lives are only now being explored. The strength and passion of the women's opposition to the treaty suggests that for politically active women, the Republic symbolised a break with the past and significant change. The treaty split and ensuing civil war threatened the survival of the state. The bitter divisions, the violence and destruction gave comfort to those, and there were many, who believed that the Irish people were incapable of self-government. Many commentaries at the time, written from a unionist perspective, some in Ireland and many in Britain, described the conflict as evidence of Irish barbarity and propensity to anarchy. Britain had its contingency plans in place for a naval blockade of the Irish ports, the first step to resuming control if the anti-treaty forces had prevailed. 
Many of Irish business elite and banking elite would have welcomed that collapse of the new state and a reversion to some form of subordinate status to Britain. In the years 1922-23, as Ronan Fanning showed, the Irish Free State secured much greater sympathy and practical support from the British Treasury when it was running out of money than it did from the Irish banks. At issue also was the survival of a parliamentary democracy, though I agree with Dermot that the story is more complex than Tom Garvin might suggest. The history of Ireland during the years 1912-23 is one of a dialectic between parliamentary democracy and physical force. The tensions between the two strands were evident in the years 1919-21, to when an elected assembly, Dáil Éireann, coexisted with the IRA. But the Dáil failed to secure effective control over the military, and there was also another secret organisation, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, lurking in the background. The results of the 1922 election indicated that many voters wanted a return to some form of normality. Over 78% of votes in the election went to parties and candidates that supported the treaty settlement. Though as Dermot has noted, up to three quarters of our IRA volunteers are reported to oppose that settlement. For many young men who were active in the War of Independence, and young women as well indeed, and who were perhaps fated as heroes, normality went returning to life on the working on the family farm, the family business, subject to parental dictates, or working as an impoverished urban labourer, or more commonly still, unemployment. So it is perhaps not surprising that many were prepared to continue that fight. They weren't unique. In the immediate aftermath of World War I, there were many demobilised soldiers scattered throughout Europe, particularly on the eastern fringes, seeking a new role for themselves and some new form of excitement. The Black and Tans were recruited from such men, and the large numbers recruited into the Irish National Army in 1922, following the outbreak of civil war, included many Irish men who had fought in the Great War. Government victory in the Civil War doesn't end that threat of violence from the IRA and its offshoots, or from demobilised and disenchanted members of the National Army. This remained a recurring prospect throughout the first decades of the new state. There were no real winners in this conflict, with the possible exception of Sir James Craig and the Government of Northern Ireland, who were granted the time and space to consolidate unionist rule, including the abolition of proportional representation, while nationalist Ireland fought a bitter and divisive civil war. The emotional and physical consequences of this conflict were momentous, as the stories that Dermot has told us from the military pensions file indicate. And the cost of repairing the physical damage, on top of the destruction caused during the War of Independence, was a crippling burden on the new state, and one that forced that government to adopt a policy of austerity with respect to spending on social and economic development. Mary Cullen has noted that one of the most striking features of post-treaty politics in the Irish Free State was the sudden disappearance from the public political arena of many of the women who had become prominent there. I personally believe that the intellectually pure stance taken by so many talented and committed women who stood by the Republic, not just in 1922, but again in 1927 and later, reiterating their determination not to take their seats in Dáil Éireann, had serious long-term consequences for women's place in Irish politics. Their abstention made it possible for male politicians to indulge, as sadly they did, in outbursts of misogyny, stereotyping women as incapable of participating in democratic politics. P.S. O'Hegarty described Republican women as the implacable and irrational upholders of death and destruction. He claimed that with women in political power, there would be no more peace and he wasn't alone. If I was to summarise the 1920s in Ireland in one word, it would have to be disillusion. The heady expectations that were associated with the Irish Revolution, the 1916 proclamation, the democratic programme of the First Dáil, the promises of an end to the degradation of British-style poor law, the hopes of many landless labourers and non-inheriting farmers' sons that they would acquire land and become farmers, all faded away as the new state and its people struggled with the realities of unemployment, poverty and emigration. 
One of the phrases that has been widely used over the decade of centenaries, and Fergal mentioned it in his talk, is the emphasis on shared histories. The history of the treaty and the bitter and violent aftermath was shared by those who opposed the settlement and those who supported it. It's evidence that shared histories are not necessarily happy or harmonious. But I would like to conclude by echoing Dermot's conclusion, closing words. We do need to show more empathy for the passions that drove many of those who were involved in the Irish Revolution and the challenges that they faced when those heady days were over in adjusting to the mundane and often grim realities of 1920s Ireland. Thank you, Mary. Our next speaker is Dohi O'Coroin. He lectures in the School of History and Geography at DCU and is chair of the MA in History. He has published widely on the Irish Revolution, 1912 to 2023, and on Irish Catholicism. His latest book, co-authored with Eunan O'Halpin, is the landmark, The Dead of the Irish Revolution, the first comprehensive account to record and analyze the all deaths arising from the Irish Revolution between 1916 and 1921. Thank you, John. Uh, it is a great privilege to, be, to participate in the fourth installment of Machnav and to share some reflections with you on how the events of a century ago shaped church-state relations. Between 1918 and 1923, the stance of the Irish Catholic hierarchy was characterized by repudiation of political violence, but not the goal of Irish independence, obeisance to the legally constituted government, advocacy of majority rule, hostility towards partition, and perhaps most of all, a desire for peace, order, and stability. Three issues mentioned by Professor Ferreter were of particular significance to church authorities. Upholding democratic principles, the Ulster question, and misplaced hopes in the Boundary Commission. When the negotiations in London began, the hierarchy issued a resolution seeking permanent friendship between the two countries and calling for, quote, a great act of national freedom, untrammeled by limitations and free from the hateful spirit of partition. The bishops were distressed by the plight of Northern nationalists who had borne the brunt of sectarian strife in Northern Ireland since the summer of 1920. The hierarchy had frequently condemned what they considered a campaign of extermination, but during the treaty negotiations, they maintained a discreet silence. Whereas the hierarchy had been regularly consulted about home rule by the Irish party, that was not the case with Sinn Féin ahead of the treaty negotiations. An exception was the involvement of senior clergy and five northern bishops in the Committee of Information on the case of Ulster, established in September 1921 to assemble information for the Irish delegation. If anything, this reflected Sinn Féin's lack of knowledge of northern conditions, as much as the centrality of the church in northern political life. Unsurprisingly, the bishops welcomed the treaty and favored its ratification. On the 13th of December, they issued a careful statement that praised the patriotism and honesty of purpose of the Irish negotiating team and hoped that TDs in the Dáil would have before their minds the best interests of the country. As those parliamentary debates became increasingly polarized, the bishops exerted political and moral pressure on TDs to uphold majority opinion by supporting the treaty. Archbishop Edward Byrne of Dublin wrote to Eamon de Valera on the 3rd of January, 1922, to suggest a means whereby de Valera and others could register their protest against the treaty but avoid, in the Archbishop's words, being placed in the undesirable position of acting against the declared will of the people. This appeal was unsuccessful. Among the Northern bishops, enthusiasm for the settlement was tempered 
by anxiety about partition. The big blot on the treaty, as Bishop Patrick McKenna of Clougher put it. They reluctantly concluded that the treaty offered the best hope of all Ireland unity. This was not as absurd as it might appear in hindsight. It was rooted in the expectation, something encouraged by Griffith and Collins, that Northern Ireland would be forced to accept inclusion into the Irish Free State. The influential Bishop Joseph McRory of Down and Connor brought three concerns to a meeting of the Provisional Government in Dublin at the end of January 1922. The first was the hope that James Craig, the Northern Premier, could be urged to come into the Irish Free State at once. The second were concerns that Catholic education would be safeguarded. And the third was the Bishop's fear that the policy of non-recognition of the Northern Government, advocated by Michael Collins, would in fact leave Northern nationalists fighting alone. Collins mollified the bishop by agreeing to pay the salaries of teachers who refused to recognize the Northern Ministry of Education and also by establishing a Northeastern Advisory Committee, which included Bishops McRory, Mulhern and McKenna. In the event, the policy of non-recognition ended with the death of Collins and any vague hopes of an all-Ireland settlement were extinguished on the 7th of December 1922, when James Craig excluded Northern Ireland from the jurisdiction of the Free State under the treaty. Against a deteriorating political and military situation, most Catholic bishops used their Lenten pastorals in February 1922 to bolster support for the treaty. Archbishop Gilmartin of Tum prayed for deliverance from the curse of disunion, a theme put more forcefully by Michael Fogarty of Killaloo, who stated, Ireland is now the sovereign mistress of her own life. The rusty chains of bondage are scrapped forever, unless, indeed, by our own folly, we put them on again. In word and deed, the hierarchy attempted to avert the disaster of civil war. A statement on the 26th of April 1922 made clear their view that the treaty was a national question that could only be settled by the national will and that the anti-treatyite occupation of the four courts amounted to military despotism and a confiscation of the people's rights. A second statement offered a bitter reflection on the Northern government which was ranked, and I quote, more nearly with the government of the Turk in his worst days than with anything to be found anywhere in a Christian state and where Catholics were subjected to a savage persecution which is hardly paralleled by the bitterest suffering of the Armenians, end of quote. Now also at this time, the Lord Mayor of Dublin and Archbishop Byrne held a conference of pro- and anti-treaty representatives in the Mansion House. This effort at mediation, predictably perhaps, ended in failure. Divisions over the treaty and the outbreak of civil war dismayed Northern nationalists and their clerical leaders. As early as January 1922, Cardinal Michael Logue of Armagh had to be talked out of publicly condemning the stance of de Valera. Northern nationalist grievances were augmented by the abolition in September 1922 of proportional representation in local government elections and the subsequent redrawing of electoral boundaries and furthermore the imposition of a declaration of allegiance and service to the monarch and his government in Northern Ireland. The Catholic hierarchy unequivocally upheld the authority of the provisional government on the outbreak of civil war and was committed to the survival of the treaty settlement. Throughout the summer, 
individual bishops repeatedly decried violations of moral law. This was easier in 1922 than during the War of Independence because in Patrick Murray's evocative phrase, the church was sustaining the authority of an Irish state. This extended to producing a politically partisan pastoral on the 10th of October, 1922, which rejected the legitimacy of the Republican campaign because, quote, no one is justified in rebelling against the legitimate government set up by the nation and acting within its rights. Now, this was something reinforced by the overwhelming endorsement of the treaty at the June 1922 election. The pastoral also threatened to deprive those engaged in unlawful rebellion of the sacraments and to suspend priests who gave spiritual aid to the anti-treaty IRA. Outraged Republicans subsequently petitioned the Pope. The effectiveness of the October 1922 pastoral was, however, uncertain. It may have emboldened the government in its ruthless prosecution of the civil war. Privately, the bishops were appalled at the policy of summary executions, which Ar Archbishop Byrne considered not only unwise, but entirely unjustifiable from the moral point of view. Episcopal appeals for clemency were ignored, and this is a reminder to us of the limited political influence of the bishops at this time. However dismayed their lordships were in private at the excesses of the Irish government and the National Army during the Civil War, no public condemnation was issued. In this, there was an element of pragmatic self-interest. The unpalatable reality of a northern government hostile to Catholic interests increased the hierarchy's determination to secure the free state and the opportunities that it promised, not least for the church. For northern nationalists and church figures, the treaty settlement and the Boundary Commission were regarded as a means of salvation from the northern government. Lobbying by clergy in border areas led to the establishment of a Northeast Boundary Bureau in October 1922 to compile data in anticipation of the commission. The commission, of course, was delayed until November 1924 by the civil war in Ireland and by political instability in Britain. The hopes of Northern nationalists were shattered in November 1925 when the leaked Boundary Commission report recommended only minor changes to the 1920 boundary. The controversial report was suppressed and the British, Free State and Northern governments agreed in December to leave the political boundary unaltered. The bitterness of Northern nationalists was captured by Keir Healy, the Sinn Féin MP for Fermanagh and Tyrone. He described the agreement in December as, quote, a betrayal of the nationalists of the North and a denial of every statement put forward by the Free State in their alleged support of our cause since 1921. John Redmond was driven from public life for even suggesting partition for a period of five years. The new leaders agreed to partition forever." End of quote. So there was a sense, as Oliver Rafferty has argued, that Northern nationalists and their clerical leaders felt alienated from both parts of the island at this time. And this is another manifestation of that sense of disillusion that uh, Dermot and Mary have referred to uh, in their papers. The settlements, divisions, and strife of the early 1920s shaped church-state relations on the island in five significant ways. First, despite political partition, all the main Christian churches continued to operate on an all-Ireland basis. This did not mean, of course, that Catholic bishops accepted partition. One example of this um, comes from Derry. In his consecration uh, address as bishop in 1926, Bernard O'Kane referred to the anomaly and absurdity 
of having one part of his diocese in one kingdom and the remainder in another state, and he pledged to work for a united Ireland. But for the Catholic Church, there was never any question that partition would compromise or fracture its religious unity. The Church's map image remained an undivided all-Ireland one. Second, partition proved deeply traumatic for the Catholic Church. Given the number of its adherents in Northern Ireland, the appalling civil strife there between 1920 and 1922, and the Church's fears for Catholic education. Unsurprisingly, resentment and political aloofness lingered, a sense of being in, but certainly never of, the Northern state. Among church leaders, this only changed significantly when the opportunities occasioned by the welfare state after the Second World War demanded greater pragmatism in their interactions with the Northern state. Third, partition reinforced the association of political allegiance and religious affiliation on both sides of the border. In 1926, 93% of the population of the Free State was Catholic. This had a significant bearing, of course, on the political and public culture and on the status enjoyed by the Church. Fourth, the Catholic Church played a significant role in the state-building project by providing an unrivaled institutional presence in the Free State and dominating significant policy areas, education in particular. And lastly, Catholicism helped to bind some of the wounds inflicted by the Civil War in the South. There was remarkably little Republican resentment towards the Church, and no anti-clerical party developed. The devout Catholicism of de Valera and many of his soldiers of destiny helped to ensure continued harmony in church-state relations when Fianna Fáil took office in 1932. Sinéad Thank you, Dohi. Um, Margaret Kelleher is Professor and Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature and uh, Drama at University College Dublin. Her publications include The Mam Trasna Murders, Language, Life and Death at 19th Century Ireland. She's Chair of the Irish Film Board and UCD Academic Lead for the Museum of Literature Ireland. Margaret Kelleher. A Ultron, a Kahirlig, a Guina Ushla, is Kusha Nordum, Fragra Horth, O Kurs Litriacta. We had fed the heart on fantasies, the hearts grown brutal from the fair, more substance in our enmities than in our love. O honeybees, come build in the empty house of the stair. These famous lines by W.B. Yeats come from the stair's nest by the window, section six of his long poem. Meditations in Time of Civil War. They were composed in Tour Valley League Galway in July 1922 during the first weeks of the Civil War, a time when, to quote Yeats, there were no newspapers, no reliable news, we did not know who had won or who had lost, and even after newspapers came, one never knew what was happening on the other side of the hill or of the line of trees. Ford cars passed the house from time to time, with coffins standing upon end between the seats, and sometimes at night we heard an explosion, and once by day saw the smoke made by the burning of a great neighbouring house. Men must have lived so through many tumultuous centuries. One felt an overmasting desire not to grow unhappy or embittered, nor to lose all sense of the beauty of nature. A stair, our west of Ireland name for a starling, had built in a hole beside my window, and I made these verses out of the feeling of the moment. On the 15th of July, a Free State soldier was shot at Gort Ro Railway Bridge. A boy from Connemara, according to Yeats. His death and other contemporary events shadow the following lines. We are closed in and the key is turned in our uncertainty. Somewhere a man is killed or a house burned, 
yet no clear fact to be discerned, come build in the empty house of the stair. A barricade of stone or of wood, some 14 days of civil war. Last night they trundled down the road, that dead young soldier in his blood, come build in the empty house of the stair. In 1995, as part of his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Seamus Heaney directly invoked this poem. Yeats's Meditations, Heaney emphasised, is a poem which spoke not only to the civil strife of 1920s Ireland, but also to much more recent schisms. I have heard this poem repeated often, in whole and in part, by people in Ireland over the past 25 years, and no wonder. It knows that the massacre will happen again on the roadside, that the workers in the minibus are going to be lined up and shot down just after quitting time. But it also credits as a reality the squeeze of the hand, the actuality of sympathy and protectiveness between living creatures. For Heaney, Yeats's poem achieves a precious doubleness of being tender-minded and tough-minded, telling hard truths, but also enabling empathy with another. To quote again from Heaney, it satisfies the contradictory needs which consciousness experiences at times of extreme crisis. The need on the one hand for a truth telling that will be hard and retributive, and on the other hand, the need not to harden the mind to a point where it denies its own yearnings for sweetness and trust. Other creative writings composed during the early 1920s are now much less well known. In the early years of the Free State, Waterford born Rosamond Jacob composed her second novel, A House Divided, later entitled The Troubled House. Jacob, born into a Quaker family, was a suffragist, Republican, socialist and pacifist. In 1917, she was chosen as a delegate representing Waterford at the Sinn Féin Convention, where she won a commitment to women's suffrage. From 1920 to 1927, she was secretary of the Irish Women's International League, founded in 1916 as the Irish branch of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. In 1921, she was delegate to a Peace Congress in Vienna and to another in Prague in 1929. Her diaries of the period are housed in the National Library of Ireland and thanks to the valuable work of scholars Leanne Lane, Jordi Meany and Maria Loddy, and also the digital research by Maria Mulvaney and Derek Green, the significance of her creative works have come to be more recognised in recent years. Jacob's novel, The Troubled House, explores the schisms within a family. The father is a Dublin Castle official, one son is a Republican, one son is a pacifist. All told from the point of view of Maggie Cullen, their mother and wife. What could seem an abstract conflict between ideological and political affiliation is given concrete life through the relationships of two generations of one family. And in turn, the force and impact of political events can be more fully understood. For example, one scene in the novel vividly describes the impact of the Bloody Sunday murders of November 1920, events as historian Anne Dolan has shown with an especially traumatic and brutalizing legacy. The last scenes of the novel are set just after the July 1921 truce and record an optimism that we now know to be momentary, but still worth recalling. In spite of the novel's power and quality, Jacob was unable to secure a publisher for many years. Over a decade later, in May 1936, as Georgine Meany's research has uncovered, an editor at Duffy's publisher dismissed the original title of A House Divided as too sad and said that he might consider publishing the novel later when he could, quote, risk more, unquote. 
When the novel was finally published by Brown and Nolan in 1938, it carried a defensive epigraph emphasizing that, quote, all the characters in this novel are figments of the author's mind. They represent no actual persons, unquote. By now, 1938, another aspect of the novel's optimistic ending, that post-war independence would bring new freedoms and roles for women as artists and as mothers, had a deeply ironic tinge. Given the gender discrimination against women enacted by legislative and economic measures in the first decades of the new state. Those measures and the theological doctrines which they forced into social practice carried repercussions that were starkly visible in the deeply divisive social schisms of the 1980s a period well described by novelist Anne Enright as a moral civil war that was fought out in people's homes with unfathomable bitterness. I refer to Jacob in this detail because important work is continuing by researchers and students to reclaim and revalue quieter literary and cultural writings. Artistic work that can offer us richer and more complex views of the historical and the contemporary. It's notable that the works thus returning to view can help us to expand the register of emotions which we employ in speaking of or thinking of or feeling about our historical past. Professor Verter ended his paper by invoking the depth of conviction as well as the cruel compromise of idealism. And in his recent book, he also valuably underscores the importance of giving sufficient weight to what he calls the emotional charge of 1922 to 1923, unquote. How we can best do justice to past events involves also doing emotion justice. And here, the literary and creative imagination plays a key role. Writing of the importance of fiction in our understanding of history, French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, who's been quoted earlier in this series, has observed, individuation by means of the horrible would be blind feeling without the quasi-intuitiveness of fiction. Fiction gives eyes to the horrified narrator, eyes to see and to weep. The poetic voice in Irish literature, be it in English or in Irish, or in those languages that newly enrich our national river run, is the means whereby some of what we might term the more awkward emotions are made visible and audible, uncomfortably so. On Fua, published in 1967 by poet Maura Vacanti, begins She de Leon on Fua, Fad Oling, August Fatherina. She de Leon on Fua, Nav Achna, August Dilla Nafina. In the translation by Peter Sir, hatred demands patience and deadened senses. Hatred waits for its chance. In mourning her recent passing, we're reminded not only of the links between generations to which the life of Maura Mackenthe testifies the same age as the state, but also her fearless poetic interrogation of both links and fissures. In her words, inheritors of the event who never knew the smell of gunpowder or of terror, who never fired a shot in anger, worse yet, never stood up to one. These lines, as translated by Louis de Puer, come from Fod on Imrish, or Troubled Spot, set in the General Post Office in 1986. I re er 
The implicit question here is made much more explicit in her early poem, Come Relega, a poem which continued to trouble her own writing life. Far lor on Tuasa, Conasa Higug son, Ibru on Urta, Evrohara Nanimaluk. In the translation by Louis de Puer, titled Birth Defect, how can the moderate man in his comfortable bed understand how the cold afflicts his brothers on the edge? The literary representation of violence is never without challenge. It is perilously situated on the edge of that paradox so eloquently identified by Theodore Adorno, the paradox of art's wrongness and rightness, impossibility and necessity. The intricacies of Adorno's insights deserve detailing. In his words, the so-called artistic rendering of the naked physical pain of those who were beaten down with rifle butts contains, however distantly, the possibility that pleasure can be squeezed from it. The morality that forbids art to forget this for a second slides off into the abyss of its opposite. The aesthetic stylistic principle makes the unthinkable appear to have had some meaning. It becomes transfigured, something of its horror removed. By this alone, an injustice is done the victims, yet no art that avoided the victims could stand up to the demands of justice. Here is Heaney's formulation on what he terms the thing which always is and always will be to poetry's credit from the closing lines of his Nobel lecture, Crediting Poetry. The power to persuade that vulnerable part of our consciousness of its rightness in spite of the evidence of wrongness all around it. The power to remind us that we are hunters and gatherers of values. And my gathering finishes with two last quotations. The closing poem in a Van Bolen sequence, Writing in a Time of Violence, published in 1994, is entitled Beautiful Speech and finishes with a powerful invocation of what may still await. The distances we are stepping into, where we never imagine words such as hate and territory and the like, unbanished still as they always would be, wait and are waiting under beautiful speech to strike. And finally, quietly refusing the limits of commemorations and memorably reshaping our practice from poet Paula Meehan. When we've licked the wounds of history, wounds of war, we'll salute the stretcher bearer, the nurse in white, the ones who pick up the pieces, who endure, who live at the edge and die there and are known. By this archival footnote, read by fading light, fragile as a breath mark on the window pane, or the gesture of commemorating heroes in bronze and stone. Thank you, Margaret, and our thanks to Dermot Ferriter for his initial paper and to Fergal McGarry, Mary Daly, Dohio O'Croin, and Margaret Kelleher for their responses. Before opening a general debate, I now invite President Michael D. Higgins for his reflections. In my contribution to Machna 4, and having heard a fine introductory paper and responses of an equally fine order, I seek to look at the period from below, as it were, from the perspective of the varying circumstances of the enlisting volunteer, the fellow family member with whom the efforts for the achievement of independence were shared, the same family member who might become later the opponent in the Civil War, the circumstances that would lead to one serving the new state through the National Army, and for the other, experiencing incarceration in Tintown Three in the Curragh. 
One cannot help wondering if the great flaw in the political discussion of the period is the absence of a discourse as to how minorities are to be catered for in the context of majority rule, be it in north or south. There were good grounds for the defense of conscience that a diverse Protestant set of peoples might rightly have held one that consisted of a resistance to what might be discerned as a strengthening clerical authoritarianism and absolutism of belief in what was to be the free state. There was much more than this, however, to what became in Northern Ireland a project of establishment and consolidation of a sectarian state, one with exclusions directed at the minority in terms of the very essentials of life housing, employment, education, and participation itself in the changes in the basic right to vote. The World War was over and empires were in flux. Member peoples from various forms of dominion had fought together, including Irish people, under the flag of empire. The majority of those who fought from Ulster now located the defence of all their interests and indeed privileges within a victorious empire. South of this was a state that was and had become more clericalist and conservative by the day since 1829 and the achievement of Catholic emancipation. That by the 1930s would have a profile that could be evaluated as indeed contradicting the individual principles of conscience, not only as might be perceived in the North, but by any citizen dreaming of the values of a republic. The forming of the volunteers in the north, the import of arms and the British government's acquiescence to it, suggested a legitimation for a specific form of separation was available. Volunteers were in response, organized in the south on a wide basis. What was the class composition of the volunteers and how did it differ north and south? When I look at those historical photographs, such as those which appear on the cover of Podrick Yeats's book, A City and Civil War, Dublin, 1921-4, Locke and Collins's Ireland's War of Independence, or those other books which depict the fighting column, I am struck by their youth, but also by their dress. The gap between their form of dress, with their shirts and braces supported trousers, the occasional cap, and the later photographs of those hatted representatives sent to London or delegated later to go to Dublin to debate the treaty is striking. Then, too, there was some self-selection in those who went to Dublin. Back down in the rural areas among the ranks of the volunteers or the flying columns, it is doubtful if the nuance of all the distinction in forms of separation from empire or independence was being discussed by those in such pictures. As I look, I cannot help asking, how many among them are likely to come, become proprietors of a farm? How will they, as siblings or neighbours in the future, react to their having been divided, not only by sides taken, but in terms of prospects for the future? In the moment of the photo of the flying column, they are united, both in circumstance and purpose, as well as dress. This bonding will not last, however. And when their stories are recovered, when the war of independence and civil war are over, they will tell of more than a great scattering. They will give evidence of the consequences of an inheritance pattern as to land that required not only a scattering, but of lives with different roles. Life as a relative assistant would be a lesser life than proprietorship. After the War of Independence and the succeeding Civil War, new class divisions will be created, old ones reinforced. Some will go home to make something of their meagre acres. Others will have no choice but to immigrate. Others, again, will seek some form of employment in the town or with larger farmers. Others will sink into poverty. 
Some will go on to prosper in the following decades, secure in land, perhaps having acquired more, having acquired too, status and reputation, become pillars of society, guardians of respectability, not only for themselves, but as a necessary imposition on others, seen as feeble in moral fibre terms, are suspect as to class, and thus deficient in relation to the values the qualifying orthodoxy demanded and sought to impose. A powerful element that remains as part of the context of the period is land. There is a huge proportion of land from estates yet to be divided. There are those who have identified parts of estates for which they have aspirations of ownership, an ownership not needed quite the same as before for survival, as a previous ancestor might have sought through a plot for potatoes. This is hardly surprising. After the land acts, proprietors have moved beyond the securing of the plot for survival. It is now about having the means of making a living, of being secure within the confines of respectable status, of aspiration to have even greater respect in the next generation, even perhaps to advance to a position in the diocesan clergy, take advantage of the openings in the civil service, make a breakthrough to the rank of the native gentry in the professional classes, get to bring one's horse to the hunt. At the basis of it all was land. Ownership of the farm having been given to one family member, one female released by an incoming dowry, meant the surplus family members had to become relatives assisting or find employment away from home or indeed emigrate. This was the experience of those such as my father, like so many others from large families. Siblings are united, however, in the war of independence, sharing a reaction and abhorrence to acts such as those of the black and tans, and sharing, too, the long memory of the exclusions and humiliations recalled through the generations. Many would have to go at a distance from where they were born, in the 120 years since the Act of Union in 1800, 8 million Irish people had emigrated. In 1901, of those born on the island of Ireland, a majority lived abroad. In the decade under review, the 1920s, acts of violence when they occur in relation to land agitation will be consistently condemned. But the responsibility for them after the Civil War will be frequently attributed to, among others, the newly released detainees after the Civil War, to such an extent that they will be forced to leave their home parishes. This, too, was an experience my father shared. Through 1924, the number seeking to find work abroad chose to opt for the United States, some with permits from the IRA, others without. Emigrating was seen by the IRA as unpatriotic, and as Gavin Foster's work shows. Among others, Eamon de Valera was urging Clonagail in the United States that non-permit holders not be allowed membership of such immigrant organisations as Clonagail. With all the ensuing hardship and loss of friendships and networks of employment that this involved for such non-IRA permitted immigrants. This was despite the entreaties of Sean Moylan, for example, in 1923, to whom my father would later be writing of the endless bureaucracy of the pension system. A new Ireland is emerging in the 1920s, and the shape of what will be the awful 1930s and its extreme authoritarian excesses are what are already discernible. The reformative, inclusive agenda of the democratic programme of the first Thole might indeed be invoked later by de Valera as one of the five campaigning principles for elections, but that will be a different time, with emigration having been come and established and acknowledged as an undeniable fact. There had been a clear mandate given for independence in the 1918 election, one that was not respected. That election reflected the public response to the executions, the attempt at introducing conscription, 
the perceived neglect in terms of health, housing, the poverty of life. Reflecting on the truce declared between the British government and the insurgent Irish Republic on the 11th of July 1921, senior civil servant Warren Fisher remarked, better late than never, but I can't get out of my mind the unnecessary number of graves. Indeed, there were many missed opportunities on the road to the treaty. Perhaps, chief amongst them, war having broken out, was the intervention to mediate by Bishop Joseph Clune of Perth, Australia. In November and December 1920, which almost led to a ceasefire, the bishop had extensive talks with senior civil servants and had had met with Michael Collins in secret. However, the talk stalled, not so much on the political questions as on the manner in which violence would be ended before real negotiations could begin. An agreement was almost reached for a ceasefire in December 1920, but foundered on Lord Lloyd George's insistence that IRA arms be surrendered before any negotiations could start. Prisoners would not be released, and existing sentences were to stay in place. The effective rejection of the Clune proposals was based, too, on the advice of General McCready in Dublin Castle, insisting that intelligence was suggesting that a military victory was possible. The result was six more bloody months, carnage in which well over a thousand more people would die in the midst of the violence in Ireland. At least half of all casualties in the War of Independence between January 1919 and July 1921 were suffered in those first months of 1921. Weary from war and the effects of the misnamed Spanish flu of 1918 to 1920, from the house burnings, shootings, beatings, in particular the rampage of the black and tans, undisciplined as they were, and the auxiliaries who were described as professional officers, there can be no doubt that most Irish people were worn out and wanted peace. Yet in families, great risks had continued to be taken to support those in dugouts, in flying columns, or on the run. The decisive intervention on the road to truce is perhaps, indeed, as we have heard, that from South African Prime Minister Jan Smuts, who was approached by the Irish to mediate in May, urging negotiation on both sides of the Irish Republicans and on the British. It was he and Lloyd George who jointly drafted the widely quoted conciliatory speech made by King George V at the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament, which expressed the hope that today may prove to be the first step towards an end of strife. This opened the door to the final negotiations for an end to hostilities. Smuts, along with Southern Unionist leader Lord Middleton, brokered the formal truce, agreed following negotiations between General McCready, Eamon de Valera, Cahill Brewer, Robert Barton, and Eamon Duggan in Dublin's Mansion House on the 8th of July. Both sides agreed to an end to armed attacks, arrests, destruction of property, and provocative displays to come into effect on midday on the 11th of July. There was, however, to be no release of prisoners, nor evacuation of Crown forces. As historian John Dorney has pointed out, the truce did not end violence overnight. Indeed, in the North, where loyalists feared a sellout of their position, as Belfast IRA officer Roger McCauley acidly remarked, the truce lasted six hours only. In fact, the day before the truce came into effect was nicknamed Belfast Bloody Sunday, such was the violence there. 17 people were killed or fatally wounded in Belfast on the 10th of July, and a further three were killed or fatally wounded before the truce began at noon on the following day. However, in most of Ireland, fighting did cease, and the way was cleared for negotiations. The truce between the IRA and the British was in many ways a long-delayed arrival at a destination mapped out well beforehand. Smuts had proposed that the speech to be given by King George V in Belfast to open the Northern Ireland Parliament on the 22nd of June should be used to send a message to Sinn Féin, be an act of conciliation. The King readily agreed and the delivered speech demonstrated 
a shift in language from the crown that could be described as little less than a vault fast. For almost exactly six months earlier, in a speech in the Westminster House of Commons, the same king had used strong words to attack what he called the campaign of violence and outrage by which a small section of my subjects seek to sever Ireland from the empire. This reflects, too, the importance of the concept of the empire and indeed the symbolism of its head, something which would later be perhaps underestimated by Emin de Valera. The ceasefire that was brokered on the 9th of July and came into effect on the 11th was, of course, widely welcomed. Yet the truce was not three weeks old before the IRA was warning units to keep amassing ammunition supplies. IRA Commander-in-Chief Richard Mulcahy addressed men in the training camps, warning them that the shooting war would recommence should the talks fail. Yet the truce did hold, and August, September saw the truce summer give way to the treaty autumn. The treaty debates, when they came, were difficult but also impressive in that they comprised a wider and robust stock-taking of the position by the contending parties, through which their differing views of the efforts of the past, parliamentary and otherwise, were laid bare and their hopes for the future were made public. The focus was placed on the possibilities and limitations of the constitutional options available. But little mention was made of the economy, nor of society in terms of how life would now be impacted for either the majorities or the political minorities of the population north or south. It would be much later too, while he was preparing for entry to the Dole, that Emma de Valera would make reference to the democratic programme of the first Dole. Indeed, perhaps, to outflank the Labour Party, rather than any indication of a conversion to social radicalism. The fate of Southern Unionists, too, was essentially ignored in the treaty negotiations. Though Sinn Féin had also campaigned to preserve the Irish language, relatively little use was made of this issue in the treaty debates. The majority, as we have heard, of the female TDs are aware of or anticipating the fact that what they would now be conceded would be a less than equal role, included some strongly in favour of continuing the war until a 32 county republic was established. Personal bitterness also developed at times during the debates, with Arthur Griffith remarking of Erskine Childers, I will not reply to any damned Englishman in this assembly and Cahill Brewer reminding everyone that the position of Michael Collins in the IRA was technically inferior to his. The main dispute was centred on the implications of the status that would be attached to dominion, as represented by the oath of allegiance and fidelity, rather than existence as an independent republic. But partition too was a significant matter for dissent. Ulstermen like Sean McEntee spoke strongly against the partition clause. The Dáil voted to approve the treaty, but the objectors, including McEntee, refused to accept it, resulting eventually in a civil war, behind which stood the shadow of a threatening, non-departed and very proximate empire. The treaty itself, for some few observers who had been interested in the general international independence movements, was described as having been procured by coercion and duress. The treaty was, they agreed, being proposed with a view to bringing peace to Ireland. But as we now know, it did not bring peace. Shapurji Sakhlavala, MP for the Labour Party and Communist Party, had been the only British MP to speak in the House of Commons against the treaty. Speaking as an anti-imperialist, he defined the treaty as an act of British imperialist coercion. On the King's Address to Parliament on the 23rd of November 1922, Sattel Valle remarked, either we're actuated by the motive of restoring true peace in Ireland, or we are doing it as partial conquerors in Ireland. Everyone knows that the treaty has unfortunately gone forth as the only alternative to a new invasion of Ireland by British troops. As long as that element exists, the people of Ireland have a right to say that the very narrow majority which in Ireland accepted the treaty at the time accepted it also on this understanding, that if they did not accept it, 
The alternative was an invasion by the Black and Tans of this country. The Irish treaty all along continues to suffer in Ireland from the fact that it is not a treaty acceptable to the people as a whole. Republican Socialist Pather O'Donnell was another of those who opposed the treaty on such structural grounds as the unfinished and unequal distribution of land distribution. It is striking how there has been in the early historiography such little space given for structural analysis, change, class, or its debate. North and south, there seemed to be more traction from a politics of fear. In the 1930s, the politics of fear would come to full assertion with the threat of communism becoming a shared tactic of church and constitutional politics. O'Donnell had believed that the IRA should have adopted the people's cause and supported land redistribution and workers' rights. He blamed the anti-treaty Republicans' lack of support among the Irish public in the Civil War on their lack of a social programme. This was indeed a view supported by some Republicans, notably Liam Mellows. It is striking, however, how the structural forces of land commercial and professional prosperity, respectability of status, belief and behaviour, bears none of the inclusiveness of Wolf Tones or the young Irelanders' vision of what a republic, in the French sense, in terms of values, might constitute. The authoritarian tendencies of the projects, north and south, had similarities, but were moving in the composition of their fundamentalisms ever further from each other, to give space to their excesses, as it were. As to the legacies of the fighting, with all of the peace options having been lost, the War of Independence had resulted in the deaths of approximately 2,300, and the succeeding and devastating civil war resulted in perhaps as many as close to 2,000 casualties, with a legacy on all sides of some appalling violence on civilians as well as combatants. Those who left the army on both sides were left in a perilous pecuniary state, often deeply disenfranchised, with some returning into farming small and often poor plots of land, others returning to the trades, where it was allowed for them to return. When consideration of pensions for service on the War of Independence commenced, the state set about devising ways in which to define what we might call deservingness, a concept John Whelan has developed in his book, Welfare, Deservingness, and the Logic of Poverty. Who deserves? Pensions were denied to many of those who had fought, often on the grounds of gender, class, or political allegiance. This deservingness may have been a poor law legacy, but it could also now be a mask for clientelist and discriminatory practices. As to gender, for example, women who had played an important, even decisive part in the War of Independence were pushed aside after the independence struggle in which they had participated. The large majority of common among members who were against the treaty is perhaps to some extent a reflection of this. Or perhaps their radicalism is like that of the women of the Land League who knew what form of inclusive independence would be meaningful for families. Inequality widened in all the decades that followed. Some did well, finding employment within the state where advancement could be clientelist, including also those in the professions governed by networks of access and class. For others, the employment might be in the trades or working for larger farmers who are now organising and who were given the support of the IRA on occasion to oppose the demands made by trade unions on behalf of agricultural workers for better conditions. Trade unions were leading opposition to the wage cuts being demanded by some organised large farmers in places such as Waterford. Others less fortunate had stark choices, emigration or enforced poverty. Patterns of land inheritance and distribution, now enforceable by title, resulted in, as Professor Jolie put it, families giving way to fields. Pat McNabb in the Limerick Rural Survey has given details of how the non-inheriting males 
resented this system and discussed among themselves the consequences of their inferior status, even in marital prospects, to the sons of labourers. Emigration was thus now widely seen as an alternative to a lower status existence on land, with whom they may have had a familiarity, but could never be their own. It would be several decades more before church or state would define their views on the acceptability of immigration. The Civil War divided my father's family, all of whom served in the War of Independence in counties Clare and Cork. My uncle Peter went on to serve in the National Army from 1922 to 1925, taking part in the handover of Renmore Barracks, Galway. My father would spend most of the year 1923 as an internee in what was known to the prisoners as Tintown Three in the Curry Camp. The pension files record his long and exhausting battle for a small pension, which was eventually granted in 1956, eight years before his death and almost 22 years after his first application in 1935. What were the choices of those who were not allowed to return to the practice of their trade? There was always the option of the boat, or if you could get a previously indentured rental space, you could use those skills acquired on an indentured apprenticeship to bar, grocery, or retail trade to attempt to become a publican, open a shop, and maybe find a way out of poverty. In the new circumstance, it would seem to be important to recognize the distance that now prevailed between those perceived as being the reasonable beneficiaries of the new arrangements and those regarded as the wild ones of whom conservatives would suggest defects of character should have been recognised so much earlier when they were being identified as irregulars. It was easy to marginalise those now divided who were previously brothers and in families there were those who would have to survive now in the new circumstances that meant again they could never again be brothers in the way that they had been as youngsters, sharing those memories of recounted humiliations born through the generations transmitted to them, and those times too, when together they shared the hopes of a time to come, of shared joy, music, dancing, and marriage perhaps, and the requirements of achieving independence. It would be future generations that would be given such opportunities together with new challenges, disappointments, and hopes. Yet their lives and their efforts were the ones that led to an independence that was neither gifted nor conceded easily. Yes, we must revise our history continually, endlessly, taking on board new facts and perspectives. However, we must not abuse the process in any way such as would allow either evasion or misuse of history. We must accept the challenges of our time, exercise our freedom to make an inclusive present and sustainable future. Unburdened we must be of any distortions or abuses or evasions or versions of the past. Respecting the past in its full complexity and diversity of interpretation, the allowing of respect where it has been earned at a, co at a cost is a necessary preparation for any shared ethically inclusive future for us all. We have to take responsibility for our own present and its enabled future in our present complexity. As we continue to remember this period in our nation's history and seek to do so ethically and with moral purpose, let us do our recall in a manner that allows for an inclusive reflection, open to all sides, including those who left our shores, those left below, and those who are left in a minority state as north or south to suffer discrimination in any aspects of life. Mila Buicks is Barbana. Gormila Mahagoth Uktron. Our audience at this Matnav uh, seminar are postgraduate students researching this period. I'm going to invite them now to give us some response to what they've heard in these very interesting and provocative papers that we've all been listening to. And if I could ask them to stand up and give, give us the names just before they speak, yes. Um, hello, uh, I'm Sophie Cooper. 
Um, thank you so much for all of these papers. Um, I was thinking that one of, um, if we go back to the first paper and the whole idea of who's taking part, um, I think we're still taking too narrow an approach on this whole question of who's taking part in um, the civil war, but particularly on who's taking part in shaping ideas about what it is to be a republic and what self-determination is. Um, we still have this emphasis on particularly male politicians, bishops, um, and armed revolution. I would argue that we need to take into account a more longer term perspective on where these questions and discussions are coming from, particularly bringing in the influence of uh, people like teachers, uh, male and women, uh, men and women, and also lay and religious. If you look to the diaspora, for example, if you look in the 1890s, 1900s, and 1910s, schools are having massive discussions on what self-determination means for Ireland. These are big debates. Um, this is happening in schools, but it's also happening mm. in sodalities, in community centers. And I think we need to really consider the impact of these people on um, multi-generational communities. The children that are debate, having these debates in the 1910s are also the people who are being influential in international discussions, both in the diaspora and Ireland, when it comes to 1920. So I, I just think we need to kind of take in children, but also community leaders um, who are having I big impacts at a local as well as national level. So wider sources should be considered? Well, wider sources, but also just wider types of influence. Um, it's not just people that pick up a gun or spy. Um, it's people who um, kind of facilitate networks as well. Um, okay, I'll put that to the, to the, to the panel. Jeremy Ferreter, what, what's your view on that point? And also then, what about sources? Would the sources be there? It's a very important point and it's a very fair point. And we are accustomed, I suppose, to being drawn towards particular sources um, that are quite accessible now, particularly accessible now in this day and age. Um, so I think it is perfectly legitimate to point out um, how people are formed by various influences, um, particularly during their tender years. There were a few references to this during the treaty debates where people talked about what was drummed into them, uh, not just in school, but also at home, um, and, and the role of, of, of parents, uh, and the type of environment and ethos uh, that is relevant for them. That's difficult to document, um, because we don't necessarily have a copious amount of memoirs in relation to that, uh, we get scraps, uh, we get references, uh, but we've got to dig as, as, as deeply as we can. Um, I've no doubt that there has been very interesting work done on the teaching of history in national schools in particular, which could be very loaded and, and uh, could have consequences uh, depending on the school uh, and, and where it was uh, and who was in charge uh, of the um, employment of, of, of individual teachers. But there is no doubt that in what we do have, uh, of, of memoirs of people growing up in the late 19th and the early 20th century, that many of them do refer um, to, to what they absorbed in school. Yet, that does not mean that their experience was representative of all of the members of that class. Um, and I often think, because I've been going through a lot of Sean Lamas material recently, uh, Lamas talked about his own schooling and the different directions in which the classmates went off. So if that, you know, if you were in uh, a, a classroom like that, um, there wasn't one communal experience. Uh, and again, that depended on what was expected of them, but also the kind of houses that they were growing up in. So I think it's a very fair and important point, uh, but there's always going to be a difficulty in, in trying to get uh, a range of sources that would leave you confident that they are representative. Yeah, Margaret Kelleher, what would your view be on that? Uh, I'd echo that and I, I'm struck again by the President's very powerful words about the importance of perspectives from below uh, and I think as the speaker from the floor has said uh, childhood experiences are a key part of that and, and in turn perhaps children's literature and what people are reading uh, as children is important 
But I also think, Chair, a, a crucial issue is not just sources, but how they're being made available. And I think it behoves us in this context to think not alone of what we're reflecting, but what we are in turn making available for future generations. And I think that's why digitization projects are so important. As I mentioned in my own talk, the digitization of the, of the diaries of Rosamond Jacob, for example, will hopefully mean uh, that with that wider source material, we can ask both broader uh, and deeper questions at the same time. But for, and her information also would come into that, wouldn't it? Yes. Because yeah, she was suffragist, Republican, a feminist, pacifist, and a very original thinker. That's right, and I'm reminded of that adage that when one is involved in the retrieval of history, one may not always like what one finds. Uh, and I think that's been an important point for our reflections here as well, is to recover perspectives that, that sometimes can, can be awkward uh, and, and less attractive. Uh, certainly th the pacifism of Rosamond Jacob is an exception to that, but there are other perspectives coming from a lot of these women in the period uh, that might not fit some of our, our, our points of view. And uh, I welcome the point made throughout the series that we must recover women's history in various forms. There is not a one form of woman um, in this conflict, and I really welcome the complexity that's emerging even today. Yeah. I think a great work has been done in, in recent years on the diaspora, for example, um, and I think as historians it is incumbent upon us to cast our net as widely as possible in terms of sources. And I was struck while you asked your question, um, many historians now are beginning to use collections like the Folklore Collection in UCD, which gives us a brilliant snapshot of what people are absorbing at school, of what they're absorbing at home and maybe telling their school teacher. Uh, and it also gets us around sort of one of the difficulties of this period, and that has been perhaps an excessive reliance on the Bureau of Military History and indeed the, the Pensions Collection, where our perspective is very much geared through those sources on, on competence. Um, and I think things like the Folklore Commission what people are reading, as Margaret mentioned, is really, really important to give us greater balance. But that would be a snapshot of the 1930s, wouldn't it? Late 30s? Isn't that when most of that was done and captured? Late 30s, yeah. Yeah. Mary? Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by your question. It's really intriguing and interesting. And I'm someone who's descended from grandparents and great-grandparents who were teachers in Cork and Clare. And I think what we need to get into is the deference of the society in that period. This a, there is a deference shown to clergy, shown to people with a degree of education and leadership. And that's where the role of the teacher in the community, I think, is extremely important. And how do you capture it? A, there's various ways. First of all, the number of them, and I'm, I know this, this would uh, it, it actually happened in my grandparents uh, and other relatives. The way they went on a voluntary basis to the Gwelthuk to, to learn the Irish language. I mean, a, I mean, there's a whole generation of teachers in the schools who are teaching the Irish language af in the 1920s and 30s who will not have grown up learning it in any way and are really having to work and doing it in their free time through voluntary exercises to, to pr pr promote the Irish language, and they, they play a crucial role in that. I think what you need to go looking for is into local sources of one kind or another. I think obscure meetings that took place in towns and communities, who are the people who speak out at those meetings? Who are the people that provide leadership? And we do need to begin to, to go into that. And I mean, we're into some of what the president was talking about, respectability, status and deference and uh, I completely agree with what you're saying there. Great question. Yeah. Well, but what's the answer, President? What's your, what's your opinion about sources and getting access to these other voices? First of all, I think it's uh, important that there be, if you like, as wide as possible access sought to sources as possible, but sometimes we have to rely on, f on the work of fiction and her poets, her poetry to recover that. Because many people, it isn't a case that their record is being ignored, it is that they were suppressed and uh, people were ma made silent. There are a couple of things that are very, very important, I think, in it, in relation to th some of the tendencies in the revisionism. And if you take a, a, a foundational historian like Lecky, 
Lecky had a view of the Irish uh, that was very, very close to an earlier than the philosopher Hume would have the same view in many cases. The Irish were not conquered by Rome. They would have none of the civilities of education that others would have had from such an experience. And at any time they are about uh, to break out in an expression of barbarity. That's in black and white. Now, what that tells you is something else as well. When I had used the word humiliations myself, Within the society, you have others who are, if you like, habit I would call it, habituated to their deference in order to get on and be acceptable to the local people in the big house and whatever like that. You learned how to be a suitably deferential to the class society. That's full of that in the, 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 the Irish RM and, uh, and, and all of that. You're but, but saying fiction as a source, then? Yes, I am, but not only that, I'm saying that there was, in fact, actually a real problem that isn't resolved in relation to the imperial mindset of seeing the Irish as inferior. And I also think that that isn't just a division, a simple division. I think that people took it into themselves. I find it very emotional for me, for example, to the fact that people in Connemara were learning English and that you had to have enough English to be able to be respectable when you went to the United States. I refer to her as Changa on Vokhtanish, Changa on Bod, and all of these phrases. And that that was, was the national schools as well, and the church was behind it was that, wasn't indeed, it? Looking yes, for bishops for Australia. And indeed, a long time. This and, is very simplistic. One of the most amusing things I heard was before our accession to the European Union of an I'm teaching young girls said to them there would be lots of jobs addressing envelopes when we're in the European Union. The notions, this is very important. I think the question is a very valuable question. The other part of it is the division that is there uh, about the diaspora. The, the diaspora has different views. In the, 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 the Irish Times, they had a reference in the 1890s. They have gone abroad and they have located themselves in the most powerful country that is emerging and they will never let us forget it. And their influence they, is the famine is in, 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 in their mind. And then you get a later group as well. The people who emigrate in the 1920s are at a lesser level, even when they meet their fellow Irish in the United States or Australia. They have to come in at a lower level in relation to competing for jobs. And if you look at how they're dispersed in the United States, they're not, in fact, actually sharing all the property now that the Irish Americans of the previous generation have in the cities. They're scattered everywhere. Mm. And you'll find yeah. that in the Irish pilot when they're looking. Have you seen so-and-so with a freckled face? He was last seen and so yeah. on. Fergal McGarry, you've been looking at some of this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just to go back to Sophie's question, which I think is, is a great one. I mean, I, I would argue maybe the single biggest influence on the revolutionary generation is not actually republicanism, but it's cultural nationalism. And I think sometimes the language of cultural nationalism can be misleading. We think of, you know, the search for an Irish Ireland. Mm. But actually this generation of people were so outward looking, you know, they were really aware of what was happening in terms of the development of other nationalisms and, you know, comparative kind of situations. If you look at people, say, involved in the Abbey Theatre and so on, to someone like Patrick Pierce, who really sort of personifies Irish Ireland, he's constantly writing to nationalists and intellectuals all, all around the world. So this incredible kind of intellectual exchange and that maybe brings us to the other point to make which is about um, diaspora and I think sometimes maybe there's an issue about how we write about this period because we tend to write about sort of Irish nationalism within Ireland and then we write about the diasporas you know within the context of Australia or, or Canada or whatever but if you actually look at lives and you see it really strongly in biographies you know pe people live transnational lives and it's not just you know the elite but obviously um, as your own work has shown uh, you know, ordinary people, um, you know, religious orders, the Catholic Church is an international organisation, the British Army, Empire posts. So I think sometimes we, we, we think that we live in a much more international world than maybe people 100 years ago, and also the consumption of media, you know. So, so I think, um, you know, we need to think about this, this incredible sort of circulation of ideas and influences to understand also what's happening just in a village in, in Clare or whatever. Yeah. Another contribution from, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Egan. I'm a PhD researcher at Queen's University, Belfast. Um, building on what's uh, just uh, happened with the discussion, um, my area of research looks at how partition was received by the Irish diaspora, particularly with those within the British Empire. And I think something that's really interesting that I'm really pleased to see in our reflections today is that we are taking into account not just the Irish on the island of Ireland, but in a much broader uh, international and global sense. Um, something that I wonder if the panel could speak more to is the traumatic nature of partition for those communities. And in particular, I specialize in looking at Canada and Australia. Um, 
Irish identity within these diasporas is often in flux, and uh, in Canada in particular, if we look at the work of Mark McGowan and Patrick Mannion, we see that Irish Canada is in a decline until we hit the revolutionary period where there's almost a resurgence of interest in the Irish nation uh, and in conceptions of Irishness. Um, but partition ultimately ends that in many, many ways. Um, you have a disjointedness between the Irish Protestants of Canada, who in 1920 would regularly attend Irish nights at Orange Lodges. By 1921 and by 1922, they are no longer being labelled as such. They're being called Imperial Knights or British Knights. Uh, and, and similarly, in Australia, you also have a kind of a inward uh, retrospection of identity amongst these diasporic communities. Because there were two Irish identities in both those continents. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Uh, and, and the processes of which they develop and change is, is very different. Australia almost seems to be more advanced uh, in terms of the, um, I suppose, the partitioning of identity rather than p the partitioning line, politically speaking. Um, so I was wondering if the panel could speak a little bit more to how we can better capture how partition is not just a, a line on a map, but also in the hearts and minds of those from below. Yeah. Well, it always was, of course, in the hearts and minds, wasn't it? That's also the point. Berger. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't looked at the impact of partition in close detail in different countries, and it strikes me as a really f fascinating subject to look at. But much of what you're saying, I think, also applies actually to the impact of, of the Civil War. I mean, one of the things that's really extraordinary, I think, about the, the Irish question and the way in which it, it kind of electrifies Irish people everywhere is it sort of a, a, it creates this kind of global Irish consciousness. And the president was talking about different generations. In a sense, these different generations are brought together in 1920 and 1921 in this great kind of common cause. And what happens with the, tr the, the treaty split um, and the civil war is it kind of shatters that sense of a, a united Irish movement. Of course, you know, America remains very important in terms of influencing Irish developments, but I, I, I do think that, that that phenomena of a sort of an Irish community working together was, was disrupted in, in, in previous ways. And I think one of the interesting themes also in terms of looking at Commonwealth countries like um, Australia and New Zealand and so on is the, the, the consciousness of what Irish identity and Irish nationalism stood for meant something different than in America. In Ireland, in Australia, in New Zealand, particularly in the context of the First World War, to be, to be an Irish nationalist is a much more subversive thing. It's, it's, there's alignments with anti-war, anti-conscription kind of movements. After Easter 1916, it becomes very fraught. Whereas in America, there's a, there's a much a much kind of a more separatist, Irish, and so the interplay between different notions of what Irish identity and politics are in different parts of the world is, is a really sort of fascinating aspect of what's happening in 1920, 1921, and it bears on partition and also obviously the, the response to the treaty. Um. Dearmouth Perator, wasn't par partition, of course, was sold by the British as temporary, mm. or possibly temporary. It certainly was indefinite. And uh, Lloyd George, of course, here was he was the, he was the conjurer. I, I think you used that m metaphor yourself. Uh, and he was a well-known conjurer and a trickster. And look at the punch cartoons about him. This is a trick I haven't done before. And he was a, he was a master at at deception and at you could say self-deception. Yeah, and you could say he was speaking out of different sides of his mouth um, in order to try and, and, and balance what he had to balance uh, in the autumn of 1921. Um, when you look at, uh, and I quoted James Craig's account of their meeting after the treaty had been signed, he felt betrayal, and of course this betrayal felt uh, by others too. Um, you can look back now and wonder were they too naive and too delusional to be accepting, the, accepting these reassurances. But you've also got to acknowledge what was being said privately the reassurances that are being given privately. There were those at the heart of the British establishment who didn't want this to be a long-term commitment. They wanted it away from them for understandable reasons. It had divided their politics for so long. You know, in the previous home rule crisis, you know, many of them were veterans of that. Uh, there was a compelling case to get rid of it. And interestingly, given where we are now, there was a compelling economic case. There's that line that's used by David Lloyd George to James Craig, don't cut off the natural circuits of commercial activity, ridiculous for a small island. Uh, and some of his colleagues were corresponding uh, privately, but he's leader of a coalition government. He has to look out for Andrew Bonner Law. Uh, Bonner Law. He has to be conscious of how the diehards, as he calls them himself, can be mobilized in relation still to the Ulster question, notwithstanding what I've said. Um, and what's interesting about it, I suppose internationally, um, which is being raised in the question, uh, there was a widespread belief 
even on the part of those who had accepted the treaty, that they could pursue a, an international propaganda campaign against partition that would have a tremendous moral force behind it on the grounds that this was clearly an injustice that would be recognised internationally. The, the problem East Boundary Bureau, of Prince, yeah, is very uh, sophisticated analysis. Uh, yeah, of, of who was an Ulster man and, and yeah. who, who believed passionately in that, and we shouldn't be dismissive of it now, but at the same time we have to acknowledge how difficult it was to keep the coherence uh, in relation to the Irish question once the compromise has been made, and that's very difficult in uh, Australia. You can see <laughs> the anger that's generated by Archbishop Mannix in Melbourne when, he, you know, when he's uh, denouncing the compromise uh, and making common cause with the anti-treatyites. Um, so, th you know, and, and that causes difficulties in Australia too. Uh, so it's difficult to sustain that, and yet they're still trying to do it in the late 40s and into the early 1950s, the idea of an international campaign against partition, but the audience isn't there. Yeah, the audience was, was certainly gone by then, but there, was a f there is a field of forces at work here so complex that there are a lot of unintended consequences as well. Would, would, would you agree with that, that Dahi? Absolutely. Um, I, I think. I mean, wh I think what we have to remember maybe is that partition is something that very significant uh, agencies in Irish society are thinking about this and worried about this for a very long time before um, it becomes a reality in, in 1920. And I suppose when you asked your question, Stephen, I was really struck by um, the absence maybe of a more sustained uh, comparison. Uh, between the impact of partition and the, the impact on partitionist mentalities in Ireland and what's going on in Central and Eastern Europe at this very time. Uh, and I think maybe we have a lot to learn by looking at that European example more deeply as historians. Yeah, Margaret, were you nodding to that? Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, again, I'm thinking about sources here in, in relation to the question about how we might track the views of the diaspora. I think it's really important that we look at different forms of cultural expression there, as we know music plays a key part, but actually also film, if you think of the success of Liam O'Flaherty in, in terms of Hollywood. Uh, really interesting to see how Irish themes appear in some of the uh, early generations of, 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 um, of filmmaking um, in the States. So maybe that's one of the places where we can find a, a crucial insight into how viewpoints and interpretations of Ireland are being shaped by the diaspora because otherwise we're in danger really of having a gap you know between the early 20th century and now and I think popular culture is a way to trace how opinions and and memories that weren't physical memories in the diaspora are shaped so are, are the sources more difficult to get at in in those areas do you think they, ca they can be but I think there can also be a certain hierarchy of sources and uh, and I think popular culture and often related to that women's writings can lose out in that hierarchy so I applaud Stephen himself for the work he's doing and look forward to reading more right can we have some yes hi um, I'm Stephen O'Neill and I work in at Trinity and the Irish Museum of Modern Art and um, thanks very much to everyone for the papers really enjoyed all of them Part of what I'm looking at at the minute is the idea of sources in the context of, say, um, if we're talking about the bottom of history, what the kind of ordinary person would have been able to actually know about the process of partition specifically in the 1920s. Now that sort of it was referred to at the start, the sort of uh, 440,000 words of the treaty debates, I don't think which were released to the Irish public for some 50 years. The Boundary Commission famously suppressed in a United Ireland effort by Craig and Cosgrave in the tripartite agreement in November 1925, and also. Um, e. de Blackham, I think, as minister in the Irish Free State in 1922, with the kind of move towards appeasement or kind of at least um, a kind of um, collaboration on the effort of the Northern Nationalists, also suppresses the sort of um, outrages about the Belfast pogroms, which the Free State had actually commissioned a priest to write in Belfast in the 1920s. So, if we're going to talk about hearts and minds, and we're going to you know use that, which is something I mean uh, we should at least contest. I think what we also need to look at is how sources aren't immediately available to people then as they are now, but also how this deterministic reading of Irish um, partition in particular becomes dominant because of that very lack of memory or lack of actual knowledge in the 1920s as well. And I thought I might just reflect a little bit on that and see what people would say. And how would you say, are you saying in, in, in all of that that the sources are there but were censored at the time and, and are now becoming available? Yeah, and they seem as if these things are obvious or kind of, um, I, I would suppose, um, um, self-evident um, at the 1920s when there's no sense of this whatsoever in the 1920s. If you look, for, exa for example, at Irish culture in the 1920s, I think what you find is a lot of confusion about what's happening and not like this kind of idea of this was always going to happen beforehand. Um, and that's something I would just like to sort of offer up at least as okay. a response. Jeremy? 
what has me thinking uh, about that subject um, is the idea, as, as, as I articulated through the work of Charles Townsend, this, this idea of a mental uh, partition predating a, a, a physical partition. Um, a mention was made of the Bureau of Military History statements earlier on. Um, I was always interested in them for their introductions. Do people delve straight into 1913 and join the volunteers, or do they give some sense of how they thought um, about Ireland, about Ireland as an entity, about uh, Ireland North and South? Uh, very few of them do, and it's often been referred to as an Achilles heel uh, of, 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 many, of, of many nationalists, of many southern nationalists, uh, that they don't understand uh, the complexity, and it's why I quoted Claire Healy in relation to the, uh, the northern situation and the northern mind. Uh, and what is the northern mind? For many people, the northern mind is different. It's wired in a different way, and they often see it as more, as more difficult, as you could argue they do to this day. Um, because there is that, that sense uh, of it as a place apart. And I don't think it's, it, it's not just about what became the Northern Ireland, it's about Ulster, you know, as a nine county uh, province. Many in Donegal uh, felt that they were um, somewhat cut adrift uh, in, in relation to um, not just the settlement of 19, at, uh, at late 1921, um, but culturally and mentally, that there is that feeling. That's why I quoted the idea of the Highlanders. Um, that you know that that that's a very strong image, you know, that we are being cast. Well, here's a stronger one: J.R. Fisher, who was appointed finally by the British bec as their as the Unionist Ulster Unionist representative on the Boundary Commission, because Craig wouldn't put one on. Yeah. J.R. Uh, Fisher had earlier called Donegal, which he regretted ha had been left in in the in the Free State as our Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. The, the sort of the notion of the buffer yeah, state, or the remote north which yep. is being used as a phrase even in the 1880s. Um, but we've also got to be conscious, to, to, to directly address the question, how many people have moved well beyond their locality? How many people have traveled uh, around Ireland? We know activists have, we know there are people who are involved in jobs that required uh, travel, but how many people are actually familiar with the different traditions and, and, and the different character of, of different parts yeah. of Ireland. I think that is a big part of it. And how much information are they actually getting and absorbing about different parts of Ireland? Yeah. Mary Daly, you, were you saying that, pe that we were on, on the treaty debates themselves that there's evidence of the preoccupation only of Northerners really t talking about partition? I mean, as I remember growing up, I, I, I would have thought that the a civil war took place over partition. And it was only when the late Maureen Wall started de delving into the debates and she came up with a figure of a bit around 10%. And the figure for the secret debates is, is much and much the same. In other words, it just doesn't feature. Um, I think responding to Stephen, there was there was an interesting conference held there on the 5th of November, uh, organised by Monaghan County Museum, and there was a panel which I chaired of people from border communities, local historians and local people talking about it. They came up with the term of the third country, or in other words, they were neither north nor south, and they see themselves as somehow a place apart from both Belfast and Dublin, and I think using that to get into an understanding of that, I really think to grasp some of what you're dealing with is a matter of getting into the local and the parochial and the particular, not the national, and looking at local council meetings, local newspapers, local community groups, how they interact and engage or don't engage, uh, church, uh, church of Ireland, you know, meetings, Presbyterian assemblies, how they engage or disengage with the realities of partition. It worked out in various ways. They learned to negotiate it. It undoubtedly split families and communities and um, it, you're, you're, I completely agree with Dermot, the understanding of that outside those communities was and remains, I think, pretty limited in yeah. this country. And families were, of course, split, President Higgins, as you know from your own experience and as, as you indeed told us in, in your paper. Yes, I think the, just by way of context, my grandfather the, uh, it was one of a family of seven 
and of that family of seven, five emigrated to Australia between 1852 and 1860. I think it's very important for us to deal with questions that, need, that would need another day as to the difference, for example, in the letters from Australia and the letters from Ireland to Australia and the letters from the United States to and from. Uh, I have a, a sociologist view uh, that uh, on the Irish side, people discontinued the Australian correspondence because they were, in fact, outside of cities. They were in land areas and so forth, apart from the difficulties of postage being expensive. But very and expensive. And, and yeah. they lo uh, yes, and they lost, they lost connection to some extent. I think you have to look at Archbishop Mannix as well and his relationship uh, to the trade union movement as well, and also the the central church's attitude, the incredible efforts to try and dislodge Mannix, which uh, which varies well. There was incredible uh, support for him in County Cork, for example, where he's from, where my mother's family were involved. Also, my mother was secretary of the Common Amor in Liscar. But w on the question of, of, of the, you uh, where did you ask me, I think uh, 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 we, we, you really must, it's the question we've just been answering about how very few people in the South have any really sensitivity to the industrial reality of living in Belfast. And I, I, I don't speak about Northern Ireland as one entity either. There's a huge difference between Derry and, uh, and Belfast. That's very, very important. And what is fascinating about it is I, I very deliberately mentioned I was listen I, I listened to Henry Patterson's paper in relation to the experience of his family and there should be far more 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 attention given to the incredible efforts of people who are at, at, at different skill levels uh, to keep sectarianism out of the division remember uh, if it isn't only the Catholics first who are expelled in the pogroms, but also, as you might call it, the unreliable Protestants who are kind of now. And you look at who are they, and you'll see that it is. This is why it is so important to see where the anti-communist thing is coming in and the labelling of agitators, Bolshevists, and so forth. There was no sign of very many communists in the South, for example, but the rhetoric was uh, was immense. And... There's a thing to it, too. Remember, I totally agree with the distinctiveness of the Ulster experience. Remember, you have the Ulster custom in relation to land. That's different to the tenants' relationship in the South. You also have very specific experiences in relation to the dignity and ethics of work in the workplace, which the working class people have in, uh, in Northern Ireland. So in a way, <coughs> a great division had happened as a result of the Act of Union in the location of possibilities for lives and everything. And that in turn then when you came, I think people are underestimating all the time, I think in relation to the migration. People are absolutely trying to make a fist of life. And when, they, when they're trying to do that, this is just the, the immigration figures are huge. And the immigration to the United States is not singular. It has layers and layers of entirely different uh, experiences. And the other one about it isn't about the Irish language that I, that I mentioned. The Presbyterian contribution to the Irish language is immense, mm -hmm. and also to culture and music uh, uh, and, and everything. So you, I asked uh, somebody one time about it's one thing to say, you know, there's, there's, let us say about belief system, but it's very significant when you say that your particular version is the one that must exclude all others, uh, which very quickly emerged in relation. You have Austin Clark's poem about the cabinet outside the railings not being able to coincide with the funeral, but equally on the other side, you have the bitterness in there. And you, there is a kind of a little bit of evasion going on as to uh, the manner in which a not very theological version of, it, of religion uh, was used to divide people who were trying to make a life in different circumstances of agriculture and industry. And that's the future, really. But what's f significant is the way in which people are writing out uh, the, 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 the question about the blackening, for example. This goes back to the 1930s is another day, but the, when you could, come, those who came back in 1936 wouldn't be hired in a school. The, I refer to it as the, the awful 1930s, I think. This is just everything. I, fi I find it hard to see mo morality in any much aspects of it. Right. And what about what about um, Machnov now? The f the, oh. <laughs> the future. Well, I'll ask the audience first about that. Oh, do yeah. as as to as to what? Uh, just a more general question. 
how, do, how much have you learned from the whole Machnav initiative? Would anybody like to comment on that as a comment now, not as a question to the, to the panel, but has anybody got comments to make on that? Noel Carlin is my name. Um, just from today's material, it is really crucially important, and it's been extraordinarily interesting to see the importance of what the President refers to as the people and the perspective from below. What happened for the ordinary man and the ordinary woman, in particular the ordinary woman, is something that we really have to kind of give more time to. And it's something that came across from today's talks, particularly from my point of view, uh, in just listening to it here as an audience member today. My name is Joel Herman. I'm a PhD researcher at Trinity. Uh, I think, yeah, just, just to even, it might overlap a little bit with that, but just the kind of different, all the papers were fantastic. You know, we heard about, you know, the Irish context through kind of the pension files, global context, the achievement of the treaty and, you know, the disillusionment it caused, uh, religious context in the Catholic Church, social context and, and kind of in a literary sense, um, and the history of the treaty from below, from the president. And um, I think my question would just be, uh, you know, what in these different areas, what directions forward do we have? What new points of departure uh, just from the speakers in that sense? But yeah, and building this kind of program uh, for a history of below in the sense of the treaty and partition. Okay, well, I'm going to s stay with the president on this. Just the future uh, shape of Machnov. This is the fourth session and there are two to come. So what, what's coming next? Okay. On that last question, I think this the future should be about achieving universal basic services which can be shared. And that should be the debate about the connection between inclusive economies, social justice, and ecological responsibility. That framework gives us a whole new space to discuss all these issues in. And that, but <coughs> what's coming next? There are two more Machnums planned. Uh, I think the next one, the fifth seminar, will take place in the spring of 2022. And it will be titled Constitutional, Institutional and Diplomatic Foundations, Complexity and Contestation. See, the Constitution vision will be there, but also how are the new institutions shaping up and what will they tell us for the future? And I think as well that we're hoping to do, do that in terms of both the Irish Free State and the Northern Ireland um, administration and try and deal with this issue that I referred to as well about minorities and the discussion about the majority-minority relationship uh, and so on. And then it will try and look as well as how both entities in a way looked abroad for example, to the League of Nations and how are they to deal with the International Labour Organization. That Then the second one uh, I'll announce the speakers closer to the time, and that then the sixth seminar, the final one in autumn 2022, is when I look back at all of that has been discussed across the, the previous five, but also I think it will, uh, I'll really look, I think, here at, at um, how, how can the music, for example, survive on an all-island basis, and what are the significance of films that have been made, the novels and stories that have been written? But it's really saying about it is uh, in the fullness of the experience of life, uh, uh, how are people seeing it now? So I think I'll introduce really scholars and thinkers, not just from history, but... Uh, also from the cultural theory area and from uh, and from the performing culture and uh, and also very very something that has never grounded itself enough sufficiently the, the sociological perspective and also I want I want to try and look at how international scholarship that Ireland isn't just a kind of a, a, a commodity to be f polished up for scholarship in a way it is about people who call themselves Irish wherever they are. And, uh, well, on behalf of and the... And that one will be take place in the autumn of 2022. Well, well, on behalf of the audience uh, out there watching this on the webcast and the audience indeed who are assembled here, I'd like to thank you, President Higgins, for hosting all of this and to Dermot Ferreter for his paper today and to, to the other four uh, scholars who responded to it. And thank you indeed. And the key um, website for connection to all of this and indeed to the new volume which is available online um, free of charge is the key contact is president.ie if you go to that you'll get all the details of how to access the ebook and how to watch
further developments in Machnov from the Hyde Room in Orison Uktaron. Thank you for watching.